Not everyone is willing to risk trying seafood they've never had before, but why shouldn't you? Just because these dishes might seem a little out there doesn't mean they're not worth trying. Give them a go and who knows, you might just find a new favorite. Sure, you've probably had lobster before, but you haven't really had it until you've tried real Maine lobster. Lobsters raised in the waters off the coast of Maine are technically the same species as those you'll find elsewhere, but the environment in which they're raised gives them a particularly delicious kind of meat that's sweeter and more tender. Maine lobsters also have slightly softer shells than their Canadian counterparts. And when you order by the pound, they usually contain more meat, too. It also helps that Maine lobster populations are strictly regulated to ensure their continued survival as a species, so you can eat them guilt-free, too. Unfortunately, if you want the real deal, you're going to have to shop around. Nowadays, it's mostly the Canadian lobster that's sold in grocery stores. Seaweed might be the last thing you think of when you think of seafood, but it's absolutely worth picking up at the grocery store, or if you live along the coast, pick up yourself. Everything about seaweed is amazing. It's full of vitamins and minerals, it's heavy on the antioxidants, and it's been shown to help you maintain gut health in a healthy weight. And there's a lot more to it than you might think, too. Head to the shore and you'll find many different varieties of seaweed. You'll have to make sure your beach isn't protected, and each kind is going to require different methods of cooking. But if all works in your favor, then it's entirely possible to gather a year's worth of snacks in a single afternoon. Not a bad way to pinch a penny or two, right? There's a reason swordfish is often sold in steak form, and that's because it's pretty much perfect for anyone who's on the fence about fish. It doesn't taste fishy in the least, has a firm texture that's more meat-like than anything else, but still contains all the health benefits of fish. It's also a good choice if you're looking to be more responsible with your meal choices. According to the NOAA, swordfish were critically overfished in the mid-1990s, but that led to a re-examining of fishing guidelines and today, swordfish is one of the most sustainable fish you can order. Opt for swordfish caught in the North Atlantic or Pacific Oceans, and you can enjoy your non-fishy fish with a perfectly clear conscience. Caviar is one of those dishes that every foodie would like to say they've eaten, but that many people are still reluctant to taste. Still, if you are interested in diving into the world of caviar, there's one particular kind that's perfect for getting your feet wet. Ocetra is a fantastic entry-level caviar, one that's mild, nutty, and buttery, rather than overwhelmingly briny or fishy. You can also pick up Ocetra caviar for a fairly reasonable price, especially compared to some of the other types out there. Obviously, you're still going to be paying bundles of cash if you order it from a restaurant, but it's possible to purchase Ocetra caviar online at a far more affordable rate. Even better, you'll be able to try it from the comfort of your own home, which means less room for embarrassment if it turns out you hate it. Okay, you want a glass of water? If you love salmon, then it's high time you got your hands on the best in the world, Irish salmon. Salmon has been a staple food in the country for thousands of years, and even pops up again and again in Irish folklore. Atlantic salmon are native to the country, and between spring and autumn, they can be found swimming in most rivers. In fact, it's surprisingly easy to catch a glimpse of wild salmon in the weir, especially beneath the Salmon Weir Bridge, and around 180,000 people head to Ireland each year to cast their rod and reel in a salmon. Even Ireland's farm salmon is regarded as some of the best in the world, this is because salmon farms set up on the Irish West Coast are subject to extreme tidal conditions, which means the fish are constantly swimming against currents, similar to the conditions wild salmon are raised in. At first glance, uni might not seem like the most appetizing seafood in the world. But you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. This weird little dish comes with some surprising benefits. In case you're unaware, uni is the part of a sea urchin that produces roe. In other words, it's a sea urchin's reproductive organs. And okay, fair enough, that's kinda gross. But don't run away just yet. While uni is very much an acquired taste, there are a few good reasons why you should give it a go. Firstly, you'll always be able to say you tried it, which is never a bad thing. You'll also be supporting a pretty neat industry. Uni are almost always harvested by hand, and those hands typically belong to one of a group of specially trained sea women, who spend their days diving and gathering sea urchins to sell and support their families. Finally, there's the fact that uni is traditionally seen as an aphrodisiac. If that's still not a good enough reason to give it a go, then maybe it's not the uni that's the problem here, don't you think? Sea cucumbers definitely aren't going to win any beauty contest anytime soon. But presentation isn't everything, and you might just be glad you gave them a chance. Impressively, some types of sea cucumber are considered such delicacies that they can cost more than $3,000 a kilogram. What's more, dozens of people have actually died trying to get their hands on them, usually as a result of decompression sickness whilst diving. Part of what makes them so valuable is their high fucosylated glycosaminoglycan content, which is a chemical known to help with joint problems. There's also an environmental slant to all of this, too. In 2019, the Marine Stewardship Council certified the world's first sustainable sea cucumber fishery, an important step towards improving the world's oceans. This is because sea cucumbers feed on organic waste and keep the oceans clean, 
Inevitably, the more you eat, the more the industry will expand. And the more sea cucumbers that are grown, the better off everybody becomes. That's never a bad thing. Yes, okay, so lionfish are pretty hugely venomous, but don't panic. Properly prepared, they're perfectly safe to eat. And they're pretty tasty too, which is always nice. But there is another reason you should give lionfish a go. You'll be doing the world's oceans a favor. Lionfish are native to the Indian Ocean and the South Pacific, but in the 1990s, they started showing up off the Florida coast. This is a problem since lionfish are also incredibly prolific breeders, spread to extreme depths, and devastate the native ecosystems they invade. But one of the best ways to protect these ocean habitats is to organize large-scale lionfish hunts. And one of the best ways to make those more popular is to create a market for lionfish as a food. So eat up! Mother Earth is counting on you! When you see bouillabaisse on menus, most of the time it's just a sort of fishy soup. Even in Marseille, France, bouillabaisse has become a little less than traditional. In fact, when New York Times journalist Elaine Cialino headed there to seek out the real thing, she found it wasn't as easy to find as she thought. To get her hands on genuine bouillabaisse, she had to drive out to a small fishing village on the coast, speak to the locals, and convince a chef to cook it as a favor. But according to Cialino, it was all totally worth it. The authentic version she tried was made from five different kinds of fresh rockfish — tomatoes, olive oil, fennel, and spices like turmeric and saffron. She described this kind of bouillabaisse as an acquired taste, but one that felt more like an artistic experience than a simple meal. You're probably aware that champagne can only be produced in the Champagne region of France, but what you might not know is that there's a fish version of this rule, too. According to the same European laws that protect champagne, Arbro Smokies can only be produced within five miles of the town center of Arbro, Scotland. These fish are essentially smoked haddock, but they're still smoked in the same way they have been since the 1800s. Instead of thin slices, they're served up in fillets that are golden brown on the outside and creamy on the inside. Of course, to get the real thing, you'll have to order them online or get yourself over to Scotland. There are some dishes that, when they're made right, are filled to the brim with the taste of wherever they're from. That's definitely the case with jambalaya. Done correctly, it's the perfect mix of Spanish and French-inspired flavors. Essentially, it's New Orleans on a plate. Jambalaya. <laughs> and if you're looking for the ultimate in Southern comfort food, then seafood jambalaya is the way to go. There's no right way to make this dish, but there are a few things you should look for. Traditional Spanish and French spices, andouille sausage, and damn good seafood. If you've never tried crawfish before, this is the way to do it. If you're a seafood fan, you may have tried lox before. Unfortunately, if you're picking it up at the grocery store, it can often be pretty expensive. The good news, however, is that there's a much more affordable version available, and it's called gravid lox. This is essentially a fancy name for cured salmon, and like with so many other things, you might just be better off making it yourself. While ordering gravid lox at a restaurant might get you a cheap, tasty version of lox, curing a salmon filet with salt, sugar, and spices over the course of a few days might just turn out even better. Get it right, and breakfast will never be the same again. If you see garum pop up on a menu anytime soon, you've got to give it a go. Why? Because you'll be getting a taste of ancient Rome's most popular condiment. It's like a delicate but rich broth made from sort of roasted langoustine or shrimp shells. The ancient Romans used this stuff in everything, from pork to fish dishes to wine. In fact, garum was in such high demand that the supply chain shaped a network of trade routes that sprawled across the ancient world. Garum is made using the guts of fresh fish, which are fermented into a condiment that turns out salty, tangy, and just a little briny. A treat for both modern and ancient taste buds. Everything's better when it's fried, right? Well, catfish is no exception, and anyone who's after some authentic southern comfort food ought to give this one a go. Now, catfish might have a reputation as a bottom feeder, but give it a chance. It's a mild fish with firm flesh that holds up well to being fried. And it doesn't just taste great, either. Eating catfish is environmentally responsible, too. According to Seafood Watch, domestic farm-raised catfish is one of the best choices for anyone who'd prefer to eat it in a way that won't impact on the world's delicate ecosystems. Oysters are definitely a love or hate kind of thing. But if you do love them, you'll want to get your hands on the best in the world. And those are the ones that come from Ireland. For oyster fans, the best time to visit the country is in September, for the Galway International Oyster and Seafood Festival. It's no coincidence that the festival is held in the fall. It's only then that the native flat and wild Atlantic oysters come into season. They're harvested after they spawn, and once they're gone, they're gone until the next year. Best of all, the different marine environments around the country produce oysters that taste very different to the connoisseur. This means you could easily take an oyster-based tour around the Emerald Isle and get to try countless variations on some of the best shellfish on the planet. Not too long ago, Grimsby was the biggest fishing port in the world, despite the fact that the town itself is actually pretty small. But with all that fish going through the town's port, it's not surprising they've perfected methods of preserving it, namely by smoking it. 
If you're looking for some of the world's best smoked fish, Grimsby is where you want to be. It's still made the same way it's been made for almost two centuries, and just like our bro Smokies, fish marketed as Grimsby traditionally smoked fish has to come from one of only five area companies. So think of it this way. A taste of Grimsby smoked fish is a taste of something an industry has had hundreds of years to perfect. Doesn't sound too bad, does it? Madagascar might not be the first place you think of when you think of caviar, but Rova Caviar is going to hit the market in a big way. It's coming from a company called Aussie Penser, which owns a caviar farm that was founded on Lake Mantisoa in 2009. They're starting to get seriously popular, though, and in 2019, their export numbers hit 5 tons per year. Of course, that popularity comes with its problems, and in order to get your hands on Rova Caviar, you'll have to go to a high-end seafood restaurant and hope they haven't run out. If you love clams, and quahogs in particular, then there's only one place you need to go. Cape Cod, the home of stuffies. That's the local term for stuffed quahogs, and any seafood restaurant on the Cape will have their own version of this delicacy. From the secret spice blend of Arnold's Lobster and Clam Bar to the lemony flavor of Spinky's Clam Shack stuffies, all the way to the homemade chorizo stuffed stuffies of the family-friendly Fresh Catch. Well, let's just say that it'll be more than worth the trip. Of course, it helps that these super fresh stuffed clams are usually served alongside a whole host of other delicious seafood dishes. There's a reason Cape Cod is named after a fish, you know. Right off the bat, there's one big plus to eating eels. They only have one bone. If you're the kind of person who freaks at the idea of getting a bone caught in your throat, then eels are the seafood for you. But that's not all. Eels are also incredibly rich and fatty, as well as hugely versatile, being able to be served in any number of different ways. In the future, it's entirely possible you're going to start seeing much more eel on high-end menus. Smoked eel, in particular, is becoming more popular at those restaurants that are looking for a little non-traditional luxury on their seafood menus. And despite being a delicacy since at least the 18th century, eels really are as non-traditional as you can get. When Jamie Oliver released his recipe for paella and added chorizo, Spain flew into a unanimous rage over his adulteration of one of their most popular traditional dishes. It trended it for, for weeks. Wow. And, and, and I had death threats and all sorts because of a bit of sausage. Of course, in Spain, they take their paella very seriously. And if you only ever try one kind of paella in your lifetime, it ought to be the real thing. And that means no chorizo. While some types of traditional paella are made with meat, seafood paella has become the most common variant. It's typically made with mussels, shrimp, and other shellfish, and you can get the real deal at pretty much any restaurant in the country. Just as important is the traditional setting. Paella should be cooked in a large batch and shared among family and friends. Often, the best paella is also made from fresh seafood in restaurants situated just a stone's throw from the ocean. That's the Spanish way of doing it. By the way, just FYI, it tastes better with chorizo. <laughs> Not all seafood can be found on the menu at your local fish restaurant, and nothing illustrates that better than spirulina. Spirulina is a type of single-celled microbe that grows in both salt and freshwater, and it has a very long history behind it. Not only was it grown and eaten by the Aztecs, but it might also be the future of space food. NASA proposes it can be grown in space as a viable source of nutrients. Back on Earth, it's absolutely worth picking up some spirulina when you can. It's more an ingredient rather than a dish, but it's filled to the brim with antioxidants, is a known anti-inflammatory, can lower cholesterol, and may reduce blood pressure and risk of cancer. Get your hands on some next time you're at the grocery store, and it might just change your morning smoothie game for good. One thing worth knowing about Asian carp is that, as the name suggests, they're considered an invasive species in the United States. Asian carp have spread throughout the waterways of the Mississippi and Illinois rivers, devastating native fish populations. And to make matters worse, they have no real predators to speak of. Except for man, that is. You might see Asian carp listed as black carp, grass carp, big head carp, or silver carp, but they're all worth trying. Often, these massive fish can come across as pretty standard white fish. But they're the perfect choice for cooks who are willing to mix things up a bit. In many taste tests, Asian carp have been ranked above other kinds of whitefish, mostly due to the carp's impressive ability to absorb the flavors of whatever it's cooked in. Get creative. You won't regret it. From their low prices to their fun, nautical theme, there are many reasons to visit a Trader Joe's. However, the most important reason, of course, is the delicious food. These are the Trader Joe's foods you need to try before you die. The Trader Joe's item that must be in your cart is the Mandarin Orange Chicken, which was voted by Trader Joe's customers as the favorite entree for 2019. This orange chicken is the best Chinese food you can find at a grocery store. In fact, it might even be better than the famous orange chicken served at Panda Express. All you need to do is cook it, add the sauce, and then prepare yourself for a next-level Chinese meal. Buy this cheese once, and you'll never be able to leave a Trader Joe's without it again.
On your first bite, you'll be confused by unexpected cheddar's sorcery. It tastes like aged cheddar, but then, out of nowhere, you will swear that you're eating aged Parmesan. By the time you swallow, all you will be able to think about is the next bite, so that you can hop on the delicious roller coaster all over again. They have cheese. Cheese. These pot stickers are packed with shrimp and crab that has been expertly spiced with sriracha. Water chestnuts and mung bean noodles come along for the ride to add the right amount of crunch. The dough for the wrapper is bolstered by the addition of carrot and red pepper. While you usually need dipping sauce for pot stickers, these things from Trader Joe's are perfect as they are. Cookie butter ice cream is a mix of some of the tastiest ingredients ever. Trader Joe's begins the process with a rich base of vanilla ice cream. Then, soft European-style cinnamon cookies are blended in to add to the flavor and the texture. Finally, a splash of cookie butter is added, which results in a spectacular gingerbread-like taste. This cookie butter ice cream is something to always have in your freezer, because it can make any day bearable. Eating a basket full of fries with a big glob of ketchup has become an American pastime. Trader Joe's has made it a whole lot easier. No longer do you need to hit the drive-thru or fry up some fries yourself. Simply buy a bag of ketchup-flavored spud crunchies and all the work has been done for you. These snacks are basically potato chips that have been shaped to look like fries and then covered with a ketchup-flavored coating. For a healthier spin on gnocchi, try Trader Joe's cauliflower gnocchi. Imported from Italy, it's crafted by gnocchi experts. The only difference? It's made with cauliflower to make it healthier. Amazingly, not only is this gnocchi healthier, it arguably tastes even better. This cauliflower gnocchi has fewer carbs and calories and less fat. You can saute it in a pan, boil it, or even microwave it. You may give up traditional gnocchi forever. It's amazing how much this spread tastes like a cinnamon bun. You can taste everything from the sugary icing to the freshly baked cinnamon bread, with hints of butter, vanilla, and honey. Put the cinnamon bun spread on waffles or pancakes for a breakfast treat. If you're at the office, spread it on a piece of toast for a midday snack. It's so good that you'll be tempted to just pull out a spoon, open the jar, and get to work. This is one of the very best store-bought pies available anywhere. The key to Trader Joe's key lime pie is its authenticity. The custard is perfectly smoothed, given the proper amount of tartness by way of real key lime juice, and then sweetened just right. The custard rests happily inside of a graham cracker crust that adds the optimal amount of crunchiness. To get it ready to eat, all you need to do is thaw it in your refrigerator for a couple hours. If you want dessert? Well, you can't go wrong with a key lime pie. Creamy spinach and artichoke dip from Trader Joe's is not only a good substitute for the spinach and artichoke dips you find at restaurants, it's even better. In addition to spinach and artichoke, this stuff has Parmesan cheese, Swiss cheese, and all the right spices to finish the job. Once you heat it up, the consistency of this dip makes it perfect for tortilla chips, but it's also spreadable enough to easily add it to your favorite type of bread. If you're in the mood for fajitas or burritos, carne asada authentica is the meat you should buy. Trader Joe's marinates this meat with the perfect mix of spices and citrus juice, just like they do in Mexico. While it's possible to cook this carne asada on your stovetop, it's even better to grill it to unlock the most amount of flavor. While you're at Trader Joe's, don't forget the tortillas, cheese, avocados, tomatoes, and onions so you can have an epic Mexican meal. These are spherical gifts from the snack gods above. To create these goodies, almonds are roasted until they are perfectly crunchy. Next, a coating of pearly white coconut with a sweet taste is applied to the almonds. The final piece of the puzzle is a layer of chocolate. With each bite you take, you'll struggle to pinpoint whether you love the top layer of chocolate, the middle layer of coconut, or the inner roasted almond the best. Trader Joe's has taken the best aspects of a Bloody Mary and put it in a form that you can scoop up with a tortilla chip. Whichever foods you typically add salsa to, you can confidently add Bloody Mary salsa and you'll be entirely satisfied. The ingredients in this masterpiece are numerous. Tomatoes, green chili pepper, jalapeno peppers, capers, onions, pickling brine, vinegar, Worcestershire sauce, lemon juice, and of course, horseradish.
It may sound complicated, but you won't be complaining once you buy this salsa. Fans of chocolate peanut butter cups should head to the closest Trader Joe's. The chain's dark chocolate peanut butter cups have a cult following, and many have named it the best peanut butter cup on the market. While many of their competitors underwhelm when it comes to the amount of peanut butter in each cup, that's not the case at Trader Joe's. You get a sufficient amount of naturally tasty peanut butter surrounded by dark chocolate that manages to balance the right amount of sweetness and bitterness. You can add these to a soup, but the steamed chicken soup dumplings from Trader Joe's are actually at their best when they are all alone with you and a large spoon. And surprisingly, the best way to cook them is in the microwave. In just two minutes, you will have perfect soup dumplings. When you take a bite, broth with a savory taste erupts from the dumpling. Then the chicken melts on your tongue. As you chew the dumplings, the splashing of all the rich flavors in your mouth will make you long for the next bite. Trader Joe's has put the great taste of buffalo chicken into a dip that you can eat with tortilla chips or a stalk of celery. Buffalo-style chicken dip is everything you're imagining, and more. There are even chunks of chicken inside of the dip. Joining in are Monterey Jack cheese, cream cheese, cayenne pepper sauce, and sour cream. Heat it up, and you and your guests will be overjoyed by how good it tastes. You can make your own cold brew coffee at home, but it takes time, and there's no guarantee that the result will be pleasing. Instead of wasting your time, just go to Trader Joe's and get a bottle of cold brew coffee. Made with 100% Arabica beans, the flavor is bold, but this coffee goes down smooth. You can add some milk or cream if you wish, but be sure to taste it first, because you might not need to add anything. It's coffee. Ice coffee? Tell me it's ice coffee. When you see the soy chorizo at Trader Joe's, you probably won't have high expectations. But you should prepare to be blown out of the water when you taste it. The texture of this not meat is very close to pork chorizo. But where the soy chorizo really shines is its spices. Even if you eat meat, this soy chorizo is something you should add to your culinary rotation. Taste it and you'll see why. This heat and serve meal from Trader Joe's is something you should eat at least once in your life. Philly cheesesteak bao buns are filled with succulent shredded beef, flavorful bell peppers, and tasty onion. It's a surprisingly authentic combination for a fusion item. Surrounding the cheesesteak is a bun that is soft and delicate, but not too flaky or crumbly. The only downside is that each box only contains four buns. If you truly wish to experience the finer things in life, you must enjoy the flavor explosion of the milk and dark chocolate sea salt caramel popcorn at Trader Joe's. While there are a lot of different flavors mixing together at once, the execution is flawless. The base of this snack is delicately popped popcorn that remains soft and chewy. That popcorn is treated with a mixture of caramel and sea salt. From there, half gets a milk chocolate cover and the other half gets a dark chocolate cover. You can buy a can of chili at a superstore and be underwhelmed by what you get. Or, if you're smart, you can go to Trader Joe's and buy a tub of Angus beef chili with pinto beans. First of all, the beef in this chili is of excellent quality. It's Angus beef that is antibiotic-free and hormone-free. In the chili, you will find pinto beans and some refreshingly tangy lime juice. To add some spice to your life, the chili has chipotle and poblano peppers, among others. The winner for the overall favorite Trader Joe's food item in 2020 was this everything but the bagel sesame seasoning blend. If you're wondering how a seasoning blend got top honors, you've obviously never tried it. Everything but the bagel sesame seasoning blend is so good that there's virtually no limit to what you can put it on. From grilled chicken to steamed vegetables and everything in between, this stuff will enhance your food with sesame seeds, dried garlic, sea salt, dried onions, poppy seeds, and a whole lot of goodness. It's debatable whether these corn puffs are indeed the puffiest in the world, but they may just be the yummiest in the world. World's puffiest white cheddar corn puffs from Trader Joe's are unbelievably light, but even more tasty. Each puff of cornmeal is completely covered with real white cheddar cheese. Be warned that all other cheese puffs you find elsewhere will be ruined once you start munching on this Trader Joe's snack. 
The dilemma you will face with the chocolate dilemma cheesecake is which of the eight slices to eat first. The cheesecake has two slices, each of four fantastic options. Triple chocolate, chocolate chip, tuxedo, and plain. Don't overlook the plain cheesecake, as there's nothing plain about its flavor. If you love chocolate and can never have too much, the triple chocolate is enough to send you to chocolate heaven within two or three bites. And the tuxedo cheesecake offers a little bit of everything that makes the rest of the options so amazing. Who wants cheesecake? <laughs> Truffle honey mustard from Trader Joe's tastes like honey mustard made for billionaires. It's so fancy that you will have to double check your receipt to verify you didn't spend an arm and a leg. Truffle honey mustard begins with tasty Dijon mustard, which is mixed with white wine. Next, pieces of truffle are added for taste and texture. Finally, when everything else is ready, a spoonful of honey completes the concoction. Add it to anything you usually eat with honey mustard, and you can do it without guilt. This is a cheese dip with such flavorful spiciness that it can even put you in a good mood on a Monday morning. All it needs is a few minutes in your microwave and it's ready to eat with tortilla chips, veggies, or anything else that could use a cheesy upgrade. It has queso fresco, poblano peppers, and soy chorizo. Once it's heated, the cheese is perfectly creamy. Never settle for bad queso again. There's a shocking number of unusual tropical fruits you've probably never even heard of, much less tried. But you absolutely should. Whether you're browsing a specialty grocery store or planning a trip abroad, these are the unusual tropical fruits you need to try before you die. Just for a moment, imagine drinking a glass of champagne or sparkling wine. You know that bubbly, effervescent quality, the one that tickles your nose and tongue? That's actually what you'll taste if you try babaco. It's so well known for that fizz that it's also called the champagne fruit. Pretty cool, right? Sadly, this one might be tough to find. The Slow Food Foundation for Biodiversity says that even though it's a versatile fruit that's brilliant in drinks, jams, and sweets, it's susceptible to pests and disease. That means a lot of farmers in the Babaco's native region, high in the Andes and in Ecuador, have given up farming it. Lack of transportation in the Amazon forest where it grows best is also a problem. But if you happen to be in the area during Corpus Christi festivals, be sure to seek out the pastries traditionally made with this native fruit. It's probably safe to call durian the most polarizing fruit on the planet. Here's the thing. While the Smithsonian says that scientists have only recently discovered what chemicals the fruit contains that give it that distinctive smell, which writer Richard Sterling describes as, quote, turpentine and onions garnished with a gym sock, it's still been incredibly popular for ages. It's even rumored to be an aphrodisiac. But that's not why you should try it. You should try it because some people love the taste of it. One 17th century missionary claimed, it exceeds in delicacy of taste of all of our best European fruits, and none of ours can approach it. While at the same time, the Oxford Companion to Foods described it more with words like sewage and stale vomit. Others claim that it's one of those things that you come to like, but let's be honest, you're intrigued, right? And that's why you need to try it, next time you find yourself in South Asia or when you spot it in any of the places it's actually allowed. Aki is native to West Africa, but you don't have to go that far to try it. In fact, you just have to go a stone's throw from the continental US to visit the place that does it best, Jamaica. And this is one fruit that you definitely need to try after someone knowledgeable has made it for you. The pulp of the ackee fruit contains a poison that disappears only when the fruit is completely ripe. It's so dangerous that the FDA banned it outright for a long time. And even now, the only ackee you can get in the States is canned or frozen. But if you want the real thing, head south and try Jamaica's national dish. You can get ackee and saltfish across the country, and while there are a number of variations, the idea is the same no matter where you're ordering. It's the very embodiment of an entire culture, and that's why you need to try it. Just don't pick one off a tree. Hi, I'm Hank. I will take you to the one tree that's working this year. If you're planning that Hawaiian vacation you've been dreaming of for years, here's something to add to your must-see, must-try list. Breadfruit. It's been a long staple on menus and in Hawaiian diets, and it's a weird thing that you can eat while it's unripe and tastes a bit like an artichoke, or when it's ripe, when it's sort of like a potato. Once it gets a little softer, then it turns into something you'd have for dessert. No matter how it's prepared, it's high in protein and nutrients, and that means it's perfect for spreading to tropical areas where food is scarce. Trees are productive for generations and bear up to 250 fruits each and every year. So try one, an increase in demand can only be a good thing. And who knows, when you head off island hopping across the Pacific, you might just come across some new varieties to try. Now, let's hop over to Indonesia. If you happen to be lucky enough to vacation in Bali, you'll need to sample one of the favorite snacks of the local people. It's called salak, or snake fruit. And don't let that other name discourage you. While it's a frequent ingredient in things like spreads or jams, it's often just eaten raw, too. 
It'll take some work. You'll have to crack it open and peel off the skin that surrounds the center, but once you get the hang of it, you'll find yourself enjoying a spongy bite of fruit that's highly acidic, very citrusy, and dry in the same way a fine wine can be dry. The spiky salak bushes might look like something out of a bygone prehistoric era, but competitions between the islands, each claiming they grow the best salak, are very much the stuff of the 21st century. Rambutans are another tropical fruit that not only thrive in the hot climates of Indonesia and Malaysia, but they also look like something out of a sci-fi movie or something you'd be more likely to find crawling across the sea floor. But they're not only delicious, they're easy to eat, too. You can peel the skin off with your bare hands and dig into the sweet, creamy middle. Healthline says they're also packed with nutritional benefits, and that's reason enough to give this one a try. You might just find it's your new go-to when you're suffering from a little indigestion or constipation because around half of the fiber in a rambutan is insoluble. It can't be digested. And that means it not only passes right through your system, but it keeps everything else moving on through too. So if you're heading into Southeast Asia on vacation and having a touch of trouble adjusting to a different diet, grab a rambutan. It won't do you wrong. Soursop is a funny-sounding fruit that you'll love, especially if you already know you like mango and pineapple, because it's got a bit of both of those flavors to it. You can definitely just crack one open and grab a spoon. An easy-to-eat delicious tropical fruit? Count us in! Even better, you'll also find that it gets turned into frozen drinks and ice cream a lot, so if you happen to be in the hot, tropical areas of the Americas, well, definitely go for the ice cream. Wow, it's a little early for ice cream. <laughs> it's never too early for ice cream, Jim. But we didn't have any ice cream, so this is mayonnaise and black olives. Oh! oh. And keep an eye out for this one domestically, too. According to Healthline, it's already been confirmed that this is high in antioxidants and has antibacterial properties and some studies suggest that it might just be a powerful tool in the fight against cancer, although much, much more needs to be done in that area of study. If you've never been outside of the U.S., there's a good chance you've never had a mangosteen. That's because it's not just nearly impossible to grow in the States, but it's also almost impossible to get them here for a whole bunch of reasons. According to National Geographic, the laundry list of problems is a long one. Crop yield is uncertain, a cold snap will ruin an entire harvest, and they only ripen on the tree, so they need to be picked ripe and that poses a massive headache for anyone trying to ship them. Oh, and when they do get imported from areas like Southeast Asia, they need to be irradiated first to make sure they're not carrying pests. That all impacts the taste and the price. And that means finding them in the States is a challenge, although Whole Foods might come through for you as they've started working with growers in Puerto Rico. But if you happen to be in a place where you can pluck one off the tree and try it, do it. It's the fruit they say caused Queen Victoria to offer a knighthood to anyone who brought her one after all. And while that's not precisely true, the rumor is enough to illustrate just how delicious these are. If you're lucky enough to take everyone's dream vacation and head to Hawaii or the Pacific Islands, you'll need to pick up a hala fruit. You'll definitely know it when you see it. It's weird and spiky on the outside, and when you open it, it looks sort of like an exploding star. It's delicious, too. The freshly squeezed juice has a strangely thick consistency, but tastes a bit like mango mixed with sugarcane. Yes, please. By picking up these fruits, you're not just trying something great, you're helping support a massive industry. The hala trees are used for everything from dye to medicine, and it's even used to make lays. Lenzones are a tropical fruit native to the Philippines, and they have a sweet and sour taste that, well, if you love Sour Patch Kids, you'll love these. They're not just a native fruit, either. They're so important that they've made it into Filipino folklore. According to the oft-told tales, it's said that lanzones were originally poisonous. Drought and famine came, and even as the people starved, they were still afraid to eat the fruit. Until, that is, a dancing lady came to town. She danced and sang and ate the fruit and didn't die. The once forbidden fruit saved the town and entered into lore and legend. There's still an annual Lanzoni's Festival held every October on the island of Kamayin. And if you truly want to experience a country and its people, you'll have to experience their food. In its native habitat, the jackfruit can be found across India, Southeast Asia, the Caribbean, South America, and into Mexico. But you might not have to go that far to find it. Check your favorite Asian import shop or it might even be on the shelves of your local trendy grocery store. Why? Because more and more people are discovering that it's an almost eerie substitute for chicken and pork. For real, once the jackfruit is ripe, it gets much sweeter and it's more suitable for desserts. But while it's still unripe, it's firm and can be chopped, shredded, and used in recipes from tacos and quesadillas to pulled pork-style sandwiches. You're going to be seeing more and more jackfruit in the future, so it's definitely something you're going to want to try, even if you're not a vegetarian. There are a lot of tropical fruits that look pretty weird, and Buddha's hand, which is also hilariously named Fingered Citron, definitely looks weird, but you need to try it. It's grown in China and Japan, and you'll find it during the celebrations that welcome in the new year. It's been long believed to symbolize things like wealth, happiness, and longevity, and we could all do with a little bit of good luck at the start of every year. You'll commonly find it candied, turned into marmalade, flavoring drinks, and even zested onto pretty much anything that calls for zest. Plus, it smells divine. You can even use it to dab on your skin in lieu of perfume or cologne. And hey, maybe that'll help you carry some of that good fortune with you. 
This particular fruit, native to the tropical regions in Central America, the Caribbean, and Southeast Asia, gets its name from the distinctive star-like shape it takes when it's sliced. It's otherwise known as the carambola, and either way, it's pretty darn tasty. The yellow ones, that is. The green ones are super sour. And this is one that you might just find popping up in your grocery store. When you do, pick it up. It comes with a ton of health benefits. It's an anti-inflammatory, high in things like potassium and vitamin C, and helps regulate digestion and blood sugar, all while being low in calories. There's a word of warning that comes with this one, though. If you or anyone in your family suffers from kidney disease, give this a miss. The National Kidney Foundation notes that it contains a toxin that those with kidney issues can't process. The cherimoya doesn't look like much, but that just goes to show that looks can be deceiving. Inside that weird, scaly exterior, a skin that looks more like a dragon's egg than a tropical fruit, is a super creamy, super sweet-tasting, almost custardy flesh. Custardy is actually pretty accurate. It's often served just chilled and sliced open. And in some places, it's called the custard apple. As if the prospect of trying a bit of delicious, all-natural tropical custard isn't enough, you should also know they're loaded with all kinds of other goodness, like antioxidants, mood-boosting vitamins, and nutrients that help regulate blood pressure and digestion. All in a tasty dessert. Best of all, you might not even have to leave the country for this one. If you're on the West Coast, the LA Times says you may have seen these occasionally popping up in a grocery store or on restaurant menus. They're thought to have originated in South America, and they're a little weird in that they're a tropical fruit that thrives in high altitudes. So at the very least, keep an eye out when you take your dream holiday to Peru. You ate that whole thing? A dog took it. Off to Australia, the Amazon rainforest, or South America? Be sure to try a nachacha, and not just because it's fun to say. The name is taken from a Guarani word that means honey kiss. And when you try it, you'll know why. And here's a bonus. It's not just easy to eat, just slice the skin and squeeze out the edible part. It's also much lower in sugar than other fruits. You wouldn't know it, though. You'll probably find restaurants serving this as a palate cleanser between courses, but it's also sweet enough to be a dessert all on its own. And if you happen to see sparkling wine offered with a flavoring of achacha, definitely try that. It's not just delicious, but you'll get your sweet fix without the guilt of eating a ton of sugar, and that's a win. The habuti caba is also called the Brazilian grape tree, and it's really weird. You know how most fruits hang from branches? Not so much with this one. The grapes on this tree grow on the trunk and look like some kind of weird, unnatural things. They're so weird that alone makes them worth trying. It's thought that these trees evolved in this particular way to make their fruits more accessible to animals who aren't great at climbing. Tortoises in particular like munching on these strange little things. You'll be able to find them across Brazil, Peru, Chile, and Argentina. And you'll also be able to pick up some in jam form to bring home. Bonus, anti-inflammatory, antioxidants, and anti-cancer compounds have been found in the fruit. So you just might want to stock up. There's a good chance that if you haven't had lychee, you've had something flavored by it. Long gun is very similar, and there's a long-running debate over which is better. Long gun is native to the tropical regions of Asia, and you'll be able to find them in forms from fresh and canned to dried. They're described as tasting slightly musky. And while that might not seem like a word you'd want to associate with your fruit, give them a try. At least you'll be able to weigh in on the lychee versus long gun debate. There's another bonus to this one, too. It's high in folate, which is essential for women who are pregnant or trying to get pregnant. It's also popular as a natural remedy for things like depression and fatigue, and it's also thought to boost the immune system, musky or not. Gak is a fruit native to Vietnam, and while it looks pretty cool, the taste is, well, rather disappointing. You should still try it, though, although not entirely in its original form. The idea of a very intestinal-looking inner pulp and slimy seed sack, yeah, it's better not to even think about that. The gak is bright red, and while that's the same color that makes it a little unappetizing, it's also the reason it's used in making red sticky rice often served during special occasions. It's thought to be good luck, and we could all use a little more of that. It's also high in beta carotene, but if you're even the least bit squeamish, you'll just be better off if you let someone else do all the prep work on this one. The pods of a tamarind might look like the cross between a peanut and some kind of bean, but they really are a fruit, one that's native to Africa and now found in tropical regions across Asia and Mexico. It's technically a leguminous tree, and the fruit matures inside pods. They can be eaten fresh or dried, and it's very, very strong. So if you order some tamarind sauce or chutney along with your meal, give it a taste before you put it on anything. And here's good news for anyone who's traveling to any of those aforementioned areas and might have trouble adjusting to a completely different sort of diet. Order a drink made from tamarind, and you'll have yourself an age-old remedy for whatever gastrointestinal distress ails you. Are you a sci-fi fan? More specifically, are you a Trekkie? That's reason enough to give Kiwano a try, or better yet, serve it at your next sci-fi-inspired party. The Kiwano looks weird. So weird, in fact, that it doubled as a Golana melon on an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Fortunately for anyone looking to add an incredibly weird fruit to the list of things they've tried, they come from a little closer to home. Across Africa, in fact, although you don't want to try the wild ones. 
they can sometimes contain bitter toxins. But pick up a commercially grown one, and well, while it's not going to be bitter, it's still pretty alien inside. It's, there's no great way to say this, so we'll call it gelatinous. While it starts out tasting a bit like a cucumber, it gets more citrusy as it ripens. It's also called an African horned cucumber or a Milano. But either way, you need to try it, for science. Who gave s'mores their name? Which tasty treat is one of Paul Hollywood's hardest technical challenges? And where exactly was the churro invented? Keep watching. We've got the details on the most insanely delicious desserts from around the world. According to What's Cooking America, Black Forest cake may have been first developed as early as the 16th century in the Black Forest region of Germany. A classic Black Forest cake has multiple layers of chocolate cake, whipped cream and cherries. The assembly is then coated with more whipped cream along with chocolate shavings. Sometimes the cherry flavor of the cake is enhanced by adding cherry schnapps to the cake layers. Many people and places claim that they have a lock on fried dough treats, be it donuts, beignets, churros or something else. But before you make a final decision on who's attained fried dessert perfection, you'd better try Gulab Jamun, India's delicious take on the form. Gulab Jamun is made from milk solids, thickened with flour, fried and soaked in a sweet rose water syrup. Different variants of this treat are served throughout the Indian subcontinent and beyond, but most agree that it's best served hot and fresh. Desserts are often tied to a place, sometimes so deeply that even the mere mention of a treat can draw someone back in time. For many who've been to New York City, the experience of the bustling city can be summed up in the iconic black and white cookie. The cakey cookie is striking, with one side coated in chocolate and the other in white vanilla icing and may be tied to the beginning of New York itself, says Eater. If you haven't already, take a bite into history with a black and white cookie. All too often, good desserts are upstaged by sad versions of the original. Carrot cake, alas, is often a victim of this phenomenon. You may have had a gummy cake out of a grocery store case covered with a rubbery cream cheese icing. Please don't let that deter you from carrot cake glory. Done right, it will boast a lighter texture with rich spice flavor and beautifully sweet tangy icing. Of course, some grocery store traditions, like the delightful little carrot made out of piped icing on top of many slices, are part of the fun. Cheesecake can present a real hurdle. Read any halfway decent recipe and you'll be confronted with cautions over temperatures, custards, crusts, and even the humidity of your oven. With practice, creating your own cheesecake dessert isn't so bad. Done well, it's really worth it to eat a slice, whether you've crafted it yourself or found an excellent pastry chef. It's a tangy, sweetened mix of soft cheese, eggs, spices, and a bit of sweetener like honey. Done right, it will also have a delightfully creamy, decadent texture. Literally translating to three milks cake, the Tres Leches is a rich dessert that's been around for centuries. It likely hails from medieval Europe, though it's now more famous for its Latin American connections. There are about as many recipes for Tres Leches cake as there are days in a year, at least, but a few common themes run through all of them. Usually, the base is a sponge cake soaked in, of course, three different kinds of milk. Evaporated milk, condensed milk, and heavy cream. Macarons are a social media maven's dessert dream. These meringue cookies hailing from France can come in a rainbow of colors that look perfectly eye-catching on screens everywhere. Don't let looks fool you, however. These can also be a delicate, delicious treat for your taste buds as much for your eyes. The base cookies are crispy and just a little chewy. The filling can be anything from a rich, flavored buttercream to a sweet and tart jam that's sure to please nearly everyone. I'll have what she's having. If we're talking about impressive dessert looks, a Charlotte Royale is pretty hard to beat. It's a domed dish made out of rolled sponge cake, filled and cut into spiral slices, which are then used to line a bowl and filled with a mousse. The British Bake Off recipe by British cooking maven Mary Berry uses raspberry for the mousse and a strawberry jam for the Swiss roll slices that will form the outside layer of the dish and make its first impression. With tart flavors and a striking look, it's worth at least one try. This dessert is especially popular throughout South America. Once you bite into one, you'll be sure to understand why this is a continent-wide favorite. Alfajores are made with shortbread sandwich cookies, which, in their best form, lend a buttery, crumbly flavor and texture to the experience. The two cookies sandwich a layer of dulce de leche, a sweet kind of caramel filling made out of slow-cooked sweetened milk. 
They're excellent on their own, but you may also want to try variations that include chocolate coatings, spices, coconut shreds, and more. Bobka is a classic yeasted loaf popular throughout Europe, but you can kick it up to dessert-level deliciousness with the addition of chocolate. This dessert takes some serious time, with quite a few steps and hours needed for rising, but it's worth the wait. A good chocolate bobka looks great, with a beautifully braided loaf bursting with chocolate filling. It also tastes wonderful, thanks to the cocoa, but also the savory enriched dough base. How many people have had a real key lime pie? Sure, you may have had a dessert that claims to use the unique, tiny limes from the Florida Keys, but once you've had the true thing, you'll never eat those imitators again. According to Southern Living, key lime pie has a mysterious history. This tangy, creamy treat really needs those fresh key limes to stand out. Their milder, sweeter flavor, compared to standard grocery store limes, truly elevates this dish. Known as Khao Miao Ma Muang in Thailand, mango sticky rice is a classic treat that is often served as a street food. This pudding-like dessert is made with rice thickened with coconut milk. Some tablespoons of brown sugar help to round out and sweeten the flavors, but we all know that mango is the true star of this dessert. If you're lucky enough to live in a place where the ultra-fresh, ripe mangoes are available, then be sure to incorporate them into this dessert. Sometimes, you may encounter a dessert that looks so beautiful that you can't believe it will taste any good. While you may have been disappointed in the past, don't let that make you pass up a slice of the Swedish dessert princess cake, also known as princess torta. It's a layer cake full of whipped cream, custard, jam, and a layer of green marzipan on top. With some piped details and a delicate fondant rose on top, it's fit for any princess, royal or otherwise. It's delicious! The perennial favorite Yule Log is a classic dessert served during the holidays. As per history, it's got a centuries-long pedigree. At least if you're counting the tradition of burning an actual log in an annual ceremony. The tasty rolled sponge cake probably first appeared in the 17th century and got popular in 19th century Paris. With rich fillings, tasty cake, and a chocolate ganache coating, this is a delicious dessert that could easily put you in the right seasonal mood. Food fads seem to come and go, whether it was the rise of the macarons in one decade or cupcakes in another. For the 1980s, it was tiramisu. But while the 80s have come and gone, you shouldn't shy away from this dessert. It's wonderful on its own merits, thanks to sponge cake, sweet mascarpone, ladyfingers, cocoa powder, and espresso. The more adventurous might try an adults-only version laced with alcohol like rum or masala wine. Creme brulee may directly translate from French into English as burnt cream, but don't let the name dissuade you. It's a sweetened custard served in a small dish topped with sugar. The sugar is gently heated with a blowtorch until it caramelizes. This transforms it into a delicious, crackly, crunchy crust. Be sure to treat your taste buds to this classic French dessert at least once in your lifetime. If you're of legal drinking age, then try the famous Bananas Foster dish. This dessert was invented in 1951 at Brennan's Restaurant in New Orleans, Louisiana. This dish of caramelized bananas cooked in a boozy rum sauce is plenty good already, but you may get lucky and see it getting flambéed in the rum by a chef or waiter. Flames are always good theatre, but Bananas Foster done right is pretty tasty too. Modern baking show viewers may now associate Baked Alaska with the infamous Bin Gate, where viewers of the Great British Baking Show saw one unlucky contestant's melting Baked Alaska meet a trash can. If it's not melting, however, Baked Alaska is an interesting sweet dish. Essentially, it's layers of cake and ice cream topped with an egg white meringue. The meringue is shaped into fanciful swirls and then gently browned using fire. As long as the cook can give it a little time in the freezer, it's a wonderful dessert. The mochi is built upon the right kind of rice, specifically glutinous rice, which, when pounded, malts to a sticky, sweet consistency that's just right for this Japanese dessert. These rice cakes can be formed into all manner of fascinating shapes, with some historically used for ritual purposes. Nowadays, you can find mochi stuffed with a variety of delicious things, including savory flavors like taro or a red bean paste. What do you put in here that makes it taste so good? If you want the sort of texture that only a dip into a deep fryer can supply, then you've got to try cannoli. 
the Oxford companion to sugar and sweets explains that this Italian dessert is basically a crunchy tube of fried dough filled with sweetened ricotta cheese. Within those basic rules, there's lots of variation. Chefs have since played around with fillings and coatings like chocolate, so there's plenty of variety to experience for the dedicated cannoli lover. Flan, sometimes known as flan de leche or creme caramel, is a beautifully simple custard dessert topped with a clear caramel sauce. When making flan, things are a little upside down. A caramel sauce is made first, then poured into a mold. The custard is used to fill the rest of the mold, and then the entire assembly is cooked, usually in a water bath like cheesecake or other custards. The best results are perfectly smooth custards dripping with a delicious caramel, sometimes with flavorings like cinnamon, citrus or vanilla. Lemon bars are another dessert that get unfairly disparaged, perhaps because they're often one of the more disappointing offerings at a baking sale. With the right recipe, it can transform from a bland nightmare to something wonderful, with a flaky shortbread crust and a tart, lemony curd on top. While some of this depends on your personal taste, many argue that the best lemon bars are the ones that go a little easier on the sugar than tradition, so be prepared for something zingy. Apple pie is now considered so classically American that it's entered our lexicon as the cultural culinary epitome of the United States. But too often we've been presented with something that claims to be apple pie, but is only a half-frozen or carelessly made disappointment of a dessert. If you've been so unfortunate, give apple pie a second chance. A truly good pie will have buttery, flaky crust with a warm, gooey spiced apple filling. Sometimes it's right to be a little suspicious of trends, which may unfairly elevate a dessert that's ultimately too flashy to really satisfy. Then again, dessert trends can happen because something is genuinely good. For cronuts, those mixes of French croissant pastries and deep-fried donuts, the latter may indeed be true. The at-home recipe takes a lot of time and effort to make, yet when it's done right, it's a lovely mix of savory and sweet, soft and crunchy, whether you make it at home or wait in line to buy one. Perhaps it's summer where you are, and all this talk of warm apple pie sounds a bit miserable. Maybe creamy things just don't work either. What you really need for dessert is something cold and sweet and a bit light. Consider then the miracle that is a really good cup of shave ice. This treat is also known as snowballs, though it's more popularly called shave ice in Hawaii. They're generally pretty fluffy, as opposed to more dense snow cones. Shave ice vendors also have a heavier hand with the syrup. Burnt isn't the greatest start for a dessert, but don't let the title fool you. This Pittsburgh treat is so popular that Huff Post says it's astonishingly good. It's a light, almost fluffy cake covered in buttercream, which is also typically whipped up to a delicate consistency. Most versions also boast a layer of custard in between the cake layers and visible flakes of sugar on top, but the real prize here are the toasted sliced almonds covering the entire exterior. It's a medley of tastes and textures that has won many people over. The Canadian Nanaimo Bar, named after a city in British Columbia, is so popular and tied to its national origin that the journal Canadian Food Studies published an investigation into the dessert's origins. It appears to have been a 20th century creation, with the first known recipe published in 1952. The bar cookie boasts three layers, which include a coconut and nut base, custard icing, and chocolate ganache. Sure, it's bound to be ultra-sweet, but the different textures and flavors have been pleasing people in Canada and beyond for more than 50 years. Long considered a classic dessert of Western Asia, parts of Europe, and the Middle East, baklava rightly claims its place in dessert history. As per the Oxford Companion to Sugar and Sweets, baklava consists of many, many layers of thin phyllo pastry, usually amounting to 40 or even 80 sheets of phyllo in total. It's usually filled with nuts, like walnuts or almonds, brushed with melted butter, and then soaked in syrup after baking. The resulting sticky sweet concoction is beloved by many across the world. You may first think that picarones are merely another variation on fried dough desserts, like donuts or beignets. One bite into a freshly made picarone, however, and you'll learn how much more this little treat can offer. According to Peru Delights, picarones are made out of a mix of sweet potatoes and another squash called macre. The veggies are pureed, then blended with flour, sugar, and yeast to make dough. After it's had some time to rise, the dough is made into rings and fried. When they're paired with a house-made syrup, picarones quickly rise to dessert nirvana. With good ingredients and a careful chef, chocolate mousse can become a downright mouth-watering dessert. 
The Greensboro News and Record reports that it has a long history but has maintained a pretty slim ingredient list over the years. This means a base made with egg yolk, sugar, and whatever flavorings you need. A chocolate sauce is poured into the finished base, and the resulting mixture is incorporated into whipped cream. Served in a pretty glass, this dish would look fine at the end of your next fancy dinner. There are about a thousand things to do with crepes, those thin little pancakes that can be turned into sweet or savory dishes. But what about setting them on fire? According to What's Cooking America, the first known crepe Suzette was created in 1895, when a young French waiter accidentally set a dish of crepes he'd been cooking on fire. The kicker? He was preparing them for the Prince of Wales and his entourage. Luckily, the sauce of sugar, orange juice and liqueur tasted great. Nowadays, Crepe Suzette's flambéed and brandy are a high-class restaurant staple. A finely made strudel dessert is a beautiful thing, but it's not always easy to achieve. The Oxford Companion to Sugar and Sweets explains that this pastry is made out of thinly rolled dough wrapped around a fruit filling. One 1581 recipe for the dish poetically says that the dough should be made as thin as a veil, so you know this is supposed to be a pretty delicate process. The most classic version of strudel is apple or apple strudel, made with apples, fried breadcrumbs, raisins, sugar, and cinnamon. Coconut cake is another one of those desserts that, taking a winding path through history and geography, has ended up representing the culinary heritage of a surprising region. In this case, coconut cake is a classic of the American South, says our state, though you might be hard-pressed to find an actual coconut tree growing there. Either way, a good coconut cake is a truly delicious vanilla cake base with buttercream and, of course, flakes of grated coconut covering the outside of the confection. Let them eat cake. Corn de gazelle translates rather delightfully to gazelle horns, says Sweet Middle East. Hailing from Morocco, these cookie desserts are so delicate that they can practically melt in your mouth upon first bite. Their crescent shape is made out of a flour dough filled with a mixture of almond paste, sugar, spices like cinnamon, and a hint of orange blossom water. Bakers might leave the cookies plain as is, or they could also cover them with a dusting of confectioner's sugar to complete the look and sweet taste. Lamingtons are an Australian favorite, and for good reason. Joy of Baking explains that they're generally made out of a bite-sized cube of white cake that's coated in a chocolate frosting or ganache, and then rolled in flakes of dried coconut. These desserts are so intensely popular that they're said to quickly sell out at bake sales and professional bakeries alike, being bought out by Lamington superfans. Uniquely for many delicious desserts, they also store pretty decently thanks to that chocolate coating. If you ever find yourself in Hong Kong, try your hardest to seek out a fresh Dan Tat pastry dessert. According to CNN, these little cups of baked custard are a beloved staple in many bakeries throughout the bustling metropolis. The warm, sweetened egg custard is surrounded by layers of flaky pastry baked to crisp, golden perfection. They also have an interesting pedigree, perhaps hailing from as far afield as Portugal thanks to Hong Kong's long history as a worldwide trading hub. Though its relative of baklava, the Middle East favorite of canafe, is unique in its own right. According to the Oxford Companion to Food, it originally began as a kind of pancake dish. In many modern places, it's a variant of fried dough wrapped around a filling, itself usually made out of nuts like pistachios or walnuts. That filling could be sweetened, scented with rose water, or even switched out for a sugary cheese or cream filling, depending on the region and the individual baker preparing this dessert. According to Joy of Baking, Linzer Tort is a classic Austrian dessert pastry for a reason. Printed recipes for this dish started popping up in the early 18th century, so there's been plenty of time to refine this treat. It's made out of a nutty pastry, usually a shortcake made with hazelnuts, though others have gone wild with walnuts or almonds instead. The filling is usually made out of something a bit tart, like raspberry or red currant preserves, then topped off with a visually impressive lattice top and garnished with more nuts. Generally speaking, kulfi is the Hindi word for ice cream. However, the specific dish named kulfi is quite a lot more than the standard ice cream you might get out of a tub in the grocery store freezer case. A traditional kulfi is made from milk alone instead of an egg custard. When it's simmered for hours, the milk reduces in a creamy, caramelized liquid that's then frozen. Some chefs will also add a bit of sugar and flavorings to the dessert, including tastes familiar to India like pistachio, rose water, or cardamom. Two scoops, sir? Two. Make it three. I'm not driving. No one seems ready to agree where pavlova came from. According to Joy of Baking, New Zealanders will tell that, of course, one of their fellows created the dessert, while Australians will say that it's rightfully theirs. 
If you can stay above the fray, then you'll know that a good pavlova is a beautiful thing. It is essentially a light meringue cake that boasts a crispy exterior and a soft, marshmallow-like interior. It's all topped with whipped cream and fresh fruit. If you've got a serious sweet tooth, then be sure to try the English dessert mainstay of sticky toffee pudding. Food & Wine says that these are little cakes full of sweetness. That flavor comes largely from a caramel sauce, but also from dates, sugar, and a touch of corn syrup. Some chefs may bulk at that last ingredient, but they will surely agree that the final product must be sweetness rounded out by caramel, moist, and maybe even served with a vanilla ice cream or custard to ramp up the flavor. According to Cher, a century of South African community recipes, Mulva pudding, though widely beloved, has a bit of an obscure past, with numerous different names and supposed dessert recipe authors. Either way, it's considered delicious. It's a cake-like brown pudding with add-ins like apricot jam and even vinegar used to brighten up what could be a pretty sweet, potentially one-note experience. Most diners would consider it incomplete without a rich cream sauce poured on the pudding soon after it exits the oven. In many ways, desserts are an experience as much as they are a food. This is particularly evident when it comes to s'mores, which are often first enjoyed around a campfire. A good s'more, consisting of toasted marshmallows and a square or two of chocolate sandwiched between graham crackers, is a quintessential taste of summer. According to Food & Wine, the first known official recipe for the treat came courtesy of the Girl Scouts in 1927, who first called it a some more. Dessert fans of The Great British Baking Show may recognize baker and judge Paul Hollywood's recipe for pastiche de nata as one of the rather daunting technical challenges set for the show's bakers. These Portuguese tarts are filled with an egg custard that's often enhanced, with a bit of lemon zest and cinnamon to produce a complex flavor. The custard mixture is poured into a little bowl made out of pastry, typically a puff or rough puff pastry that's meant to come out golden brown, flaky, and with just the right amount of buttery flavor. There's fried dough, and then there are churros. HuffPost reports that this unique creation has a complex history, with some arguing that it was invented by Spanish sheep herders, while others say that Portuguese sailors were riffing on a Chinese dish. Either way, many people now enjoy these tubes of fried dough as occasional treats or even breakfast food. The dough is piped into hot oil using a star tip, which creates those distinctive ridges. Some cooks decide to fill the centers of their churros with things like dulce de leche or coat the outsides with chocolate or powdered sugar. Have you ever wanted to try the classic British dish, Spotted Dick, but you just couldn't get over the name? How about canned bread? Keep watching for more surprisingly delicious canned foods that you need to try. If you thought that canned bread was only invented for a throwaway gag in an episode of SpongeBob SquarePants, get ready to have your mind blown. Not only is this a real item that's been around for ages, it also tastes great. B&M is a New England-based canning company that's famous for its baked beans. And back in the 1920s, they also started canning Boston brown bread. Like baked beans, brown bread has a strong molasses flavor, and it also contains whole wheat flour, cornmeal, salt, leavening, and sometimes raisins. People have reportedly been making this type of bread in New England since the 17th century, although the canned variety is a more recent innovation. Boston brown bread is uniquely suited to canning because, unlike most bread, it's traditionally steamed inside a metal container. The result is very sweet and moist, and it's frequently served with another sugary New England specialty in the form of baked beans, making for a dinner that's pretty close to dessert. It's also delicious when toasted and buttered for breakfast. Yes, we know that Spotted Dick is a hilarious name for food, but as it turns out, it doesn't mean what the most childish version of you thinks it does. Spotted Dick. <sighs> Can you believe this guy? I'm trying to get something to eat. He's asking me if I got the clap. The spotted part describes how this dessert is speckled with dry currants, and Dick comes from the Old English term puddock which refers to pudding. If you're from the United States, you might be thinking that spotted dick doesn't look like the goop you find in little plastic cups in grocery stores. That's because in British English, pudding either means any kind of dessert or a dish that's steamed or boiled inside a container. Spotted dick actually fits both of these definitions, as it's a steamed dessert. 
In its recipe for spotted dick, BBC Good Food calls for the traditional ingredient of suet, aka raw beef fat. If you don't feel like trying to source suet and currants to make spotted dick from scratch, Heinz has you covered with its canned version. Simply microwave it or boil it inside the can, whip up some custard to serve over top, and you're all set! Cod liver may not sound super appealing to all palates, but it's actually a luxurious snack that deserves to find its way onto more appetizer spreads. It's often produced in Northern Europe, and you can easily order an Icelandic, non-smoked variety on Amazon. If you've never tried cod liver before, think of it as the pâté of the sea. Pâté made from geese or duck fatty livers is widely considered gourmet, so why not give cod liver a try? It's incredibly rich and creamy, with a mildly briny flavor from the sea, and it's soft enough that you can easily spread it on crackers or bread. And it's also super good for you. According to WebMD, cod liver oil is high in vitamin D, vitamin A, and healthy omega-3 fatty acids. Northern Europeans have historically relied on fish oil for the vitamin D that they need for the region's long, dark winters. He grew up in a land without sun! Unlike many of the foods on this list, canned deviled ham spread is pretty easy to find at most grocery stores, though its appeal is still niche enough that plenty of people have never had it before. It's a canned version of a classic spread that you can make at home if you're in the mood. As for the devil in the name, that term reportedly originated in the 18th century and refers to seasoning foods heavily with pepper or mustard. Underwood deviled ham consists of finely minced ham mixed with seasonings. Although canned meats have a bad reputation as mystery foods laden with chemicals, the ingredient list of Underwood's product is reassuringly small. It contains just two basic components, brown sugar cured ham and a seasoning blend made of mustard, turmeric, and other spices. Deviled ham spread is rich, salty, and a little spicy, perfect for making party hors d'oeuvres. For good meat and good flavor, try the whole ham spread. When you think of canned cheese, you probably imagine something that's spreadable or sprayable like Kraft Cheese Whiz or Easy Cheese. While these items serve their purpose, the bright orange cheese product in those cans could hardly be considered gourmet. But there is one manufacturer producing cheese in a can that you could happily serve at a fancy party, the Washington State University Creamery. Cougar cheese is a product of 20th century food science innovation. Traditional natural cheese does not can well, as the bacteria that turns milk into cheese produces carbon dioxide gas as a byproduct of the fermentation process. Fermentation continues even after the cheese is canned, which can cause the cans to bulge or even pop. Washington State University figured out that by adding a newly invented bacterial strain, they could prevent the lactic acid bacteria used in cheesemaking from producing too much carbon dioxide. Although cougar cheese was invented as a way of extending cheese's shelf life, Today, it's mostly enjoyed for its special flavor. The original product, Cougar Gold, has a very sharp cheddar taste, like what you would expect from a high-quality aged cheese. In addition to gold, you can now find seven other flavors of Cougar cheese on the WSU Creamery website. But every flavor has its fans. Although haggis might seem mysterious to most American consumers, it's an integral part of the culinary tradition of its home country of Scotland. It's made from sheep offal mixed with oats and boiled inside a sheep's stomach, and it's essential for celebrating the Scottish holiday of Burns Night. Sadly for American haggis enthusiasts, the U.S. Department of Agriculture banned the importation of traditional Scottish haggis in 1971. American food authorities' beef with haggis stems from the use of sheep lungs in the original recipe. The USDA doesn't allow livestock lungs to be served to humans, as the agency considers them a food safety risk. The good news for Americans hoping to celebrate Burns Night is that some companies make haggis in accordance with USDA guidelines. Caledonian Kitchen, for example, makes both large haggises cooked the traditional way, as well as smaller canned versions if you don't need to feed a crowd. This haggis might be a good one to try if you're squeamish about the abundance of different organs in the traditional recipe, as it's made from a blend of beef or lamb meat with a little bit of liver. Lurking next to the tuna and sardines in your grocery store's shelf-stable fish selection is another type of canned seafood that might not be quite as popular. We're talking about smoked oysters. If the idea of smoky mollusks in a can turns you off, 
you're missing out on a delicious, flavorful snack opportunity. Oysters are an undeniably divisive food, but the smoked version might just be able to convert some haters to the other side. One aspect about raw oysters that repels many people is their gummy and gelatinous texture. Since canned smoked oysters are cooked, they're significantly firmer than raw oysters, with a texture similar to cooked clams or mussels. Their powerful, smoky flavor also covers up some of the briny, fishy taste that some eaters may find objectionable. Plus, they're also pretty healthy, as they're high in vitamin B12, protein, omega-3 fatty acids, and minerals. Not bad for something you can eat straight out of a can. Now we're getting luxurious. Truffles have a reputation as the bougiest of ingredients, and with good reason. Depending on the variety, fresh truffles range from several hundred to several thousand dollars per pound. Despite the high expense, plenty of gourmands believe that these fancy fungi are worth it, since their irreplicable, earthy aroma elevates any dish. The smell even reportedly affects us at a primal level, as it's similar to the scent of reproductive pheromones. How romantic! First you gotta do the truffle shuffle. Come on! Do it! Come on! Do it! If you want to get a taste of this indulgent ingredient but can't afford to blow an entire paycheck on highfalutin mushrooms, canned truffles are the answer. You can snag a small can of black truffles for as low as about 10 bucks. In addition to the reasonable price, canned truffles have the extra advantage of a long shelf life, which lets you enjoy them even when they're not in season. However, there is a downside, as preserved truffles don't have quite the same intensity, odor, or taste as fresh ones. Nevertheless, with such a steep price difference between the canned and fresh varieties, it's hard to argue against the cans. Unless money means nothing to you. On the opposite end of the fancy food spectrum are boiled peanuts. Though they are on the same high end of the deliciousness spectrum, if you live outside of the southeastern United States, you may have never tried this regional delicacy, which is made by boiling green, fresh peanuts in their shells. Boiled peanuts are sold all over the South during the growing season when fresh peanuts are readily available. Elsewhere in the country, peanuts are typically dried and roasted, but when they're boiled, they taste much more like beans. This makes sense since they are both in the legume family rather than being actual nuts. Fresh boiled peanuts can go bad very quickly, so they haven't historically been widely accessible outside of the peanut-growing regions of the country. Fortunately, now you can buy canned boiled peanuts from Peanut Patch no matter where you live. Available in several different flavors, they're sure to satisfy homesick Southerners and tickle the curiosity of adventurous eaters everywhere. Home-cooked tamales are undoubtedly a labor of love. In many families with Mexican heritage, Christmas means gathering everyone together for a traditional, communal tamale-making party. Dividing the work between a crowd helps the labor-intensive process of making homemade tamales go at least a little bit more quickly. This process usually involves slow-cooking meat, making masa, wrapping the tamales in corn husks, and steaming them. But what if you don't want to host your entire family to make tamales? That's when you call canned tamales into action. While we certainly can't claim that they hold a candle to the homemade version, they're still pretty tasty in their own way. They come packed vertically in a can, wrapped individually in waxed paper, and smothered in chili sauce. You simply dump the can into a pan, unwrap the tamales, heat them up, and they're ready to eat. If you feel like putting in slightly more effort, Hormel suggests throwing another canned food into the mix to make a simple casserole. All you need to do is pour canned chili into a baking dish, nestle in the unwrapped tamales, top with cheese, as well as chopped onions if you're feeling ambitious, and then bake. It might not be something you'd show off for company, but it's still satisfying comfort food nonetheless. We mostly think of rattlesnakes as dangerous creatures, but humans are much more dangerous to them than they are to us. These reptiles aren't putting smoked human meat into cans to eat, after all. With that in mind, rattlesnake meat is absolutely worth trying if you're an adventurous eater. It has a mild, gamey flavor that can be similar to chicken. If you'd like to try cooking this deadly creature at home, MeatManiac.com suggests using the canned version to make soup or gravy. 
While rattlesnake's flavor is nothing to be scared of, eating snake does present certain practical difficulties. If you've ever seen a snake skeleton in a natural history museum, you know that these critters have a ton of small bones. Canned rattlesnake meat comes packed with all those tiny bones, so you'll have to spend a long time picking them out of the meat before cooking. That is, unless you're fine with fishing them out of your mouth after every bite. There's no legitimate reason why you should skip breakfast, especially when there are so many delicious breakfast foods that you have yet to try. There are plenty of breakfast foods you deserve to taste at least once, so do yourself a favor and make sure you try these. If you've never had soul food for breakfast, you better hope you get the chance, because you'll regret not trying it at least once. Chicken and waffles may sound like an odd pairing, but don't knock it until you try it. Because once you give it a whirl, you'll never go back to bland breakfast food again. All you need for a proper chicken and waffles meal is a stack of waffles, to which you can add butter and syrup if you wish. Then you get one or two pieces of fried chicken, put it on the plate, eat it together, and praise whoever invented this stupendous combo because, seriously, this is what all hearty breakfast should be about. If you head to the South, you may be blessed with the opportunity to eat shrimp and grits for breakfast. This breakfast food is especially popular in the states of Georgia and South Carolina, although there's a good chance you'll find it elsewhere, too. If you've never had grits, it's basically coarsely ground and boiled cornmeal. You can top it with any number of things, but when shrimp is added to the mix, it's nothing short of divine especially when it's seasoned with paprika, black pepper, Italian seasoning, Cajun seasoning, and then piled high with cheddar cheese. Sometimes you'll even find small pieces of ham in your shrimp and grits, which adds another layer to the flavor of this epic breakfast meal. There are a ton of ways to make oatmeal. You can make it in the refrigerator overnight, use a slow cooker, or just heat it up quickly in the microwave. No matter how you decide to make it, what really matters is what you mix into your oatmeal. There's a world full of options, but when you cut to the chase, there's nothing that can compete with berries. While you can use frozen berries in oatmeal, fresh berries usually end up tasting better. Popular berries to put in oatmeal include strawberries, blueberries, and raspberries. But don't miss out on trying blackberries and huckleberries, as both of those will keep that morning oatmeal something you're looking forward to. Greek yogurt and muesli is a glorious combination that you should enjoy at least once before your time on this earth has come to an end. Compared to regular yogurt, Greek yogurt is strained multiple times which makes it thicker. And muesli, an oatmeal dish that has rolled oats and other ingredients such as seeds, nuts, and dried chunks of fruit, is the perfect companion. Mix these two things together the next time you're eating breakfast, and you'll have a delicious and filling treat that'll make you understand why it's such a wonderful marriage. If you want a delicious breakfast from a fast food eatery, the Egg McMuffin is king. The Egg McMuffin debuted back in 1971, and nearly 50 years later, this breakfast sandwich is still why McDonald's has a better breakfast menu than all their fast food competitors. If you've never eaten one, it's time to change that before death finds you. An Egg McMuffin has egg, Canadian bacon, and American cheese, all piled on an English muffin that's buttered to perfection. But wait, there's more. Considering this McDonald's breakfast food is cheap and only has 300 calories, you can justify eating one each and every morning on your way to work. When compared to regular American waffles, Belgian waffles are a completely different species. Most notably, Belgian waffles are crispier, have deeper and bigger pockets, and are typically larger. If you hate mushy waffles that lose their form the moment your fork makes contact, switch to Belgian waffles and don't look back. You'll find that the sturdiness of these waffles make them easier to eat, and their hardiness will fill you up faster. Add a generous amount of maple syrup and butter, or use them as the base for a breakfast sandwich, like White Castle has and you'll be on your way to a memorable breakfast. Ah, the morning consumption of mass quantities. Grid-like breakfast slabs, extruded mammal tailings, seared strips of swine flesh, and flattened chicken embryos. I will enjoy it. Have you ever had one of those days that calls for a Bloody Mary for breakfast? Infuse your Bloody Mary with bacon, and you'll get the vodka you need in a form that passes for legitimate breakfast food. 
You can either buy a Bacon Bloody Mary mix or let a few pieces of cooked bacon rest in a liter of vodka in the refrigerator for two or three days. Whether you go the pre-made route or the do-it-yourself route, try this boozy breakfast idea at some point before you perish, preferably on a weekend. If you've never eaten Pop-Tarts for breakfast, you'll need to fix that right away by heading to your local grocery store and picking up a box. If you need help selecting a flavor, the best Pop-Tart flavors include s'mores, blueberry, strawberry, and cherry. And while most flavors of Pop-Tarts are delightful, you should avoid those that are unfrosted, as the frosting is one of the best parts of the entire equation. Some people heat up their Pop-Tarts in the microwave, but that's sacrilegious. These goodies should be placed in a toaster before going directly into your mouth, at which point you'll be grateful that there's two in the package. If you're familiar with Creole cuisine, you know all about kalas. These dumplings are sometimes called rice donuts or rice fritters, as they're made from… what? That's right, they're a combination of rice, eggs, flour, sugar, and yeast. Once the batter is ready, this breakfast food is deep-fried until it's a golden brown. The last step is to sprinkle powdered sugar on top and then serve it hot. If you're eating these for the first time in your life, order a cup of coffee and add some hot milk to it. Then dip the callus in the coffee. The resulting taste will make your taste buds cheer. It's impossible to talk about delicious breakfast foods and not mention donuts from Krispy Kreme. Sure, these sugary treats won't jive with your diet plan, but everyone deserves to indulge in one of these donuts at least once in their life. Otherwise, existence would be too gloomy. The key to Krispy Kreme is the freshness of their donuts, because they truly have no rival in that department. If you're new to Krispy Kreme, start with the original glazed, and then the sky's the limit, because each and every one of their varieties is something to be savored, especially alongside a hot cup of their coffee. If you wake up starving one morning and you just want to taste a bit of everything, find somewhere in your town that serves a full English breakfast. While what you get differs slightly depending on the restaurant, you can expect to get sausages, bacon, fried mushrooms, grilled tomatoes, toast with butter, and eggs. The eggs can either be scrambled or fried, and if it's really authentic, you'll also get baked beans and black pudding. To drink, go with coffee or tea in addition to a glass of orange juice. This is truly a breakfast feast that you should try once before you die. If you don't, you'll have missed out on something special. Cinnamon Toast Crunch tends to be a polarizing cereal option. People either love this cereal or hate it. There's rarely ever any middle ground. If you've never eaten it before, you should definitely do so at least once. Once you do, you'll be able to pick a side. Cinnamon Toast Crunch is exactly what the name suggests. Crunchy squares of goodness that have been toasted and then sprinkled with a lot of cinnamon and sugar. Once you're done with your bowl of this cereal, the remaining milk in your bowl is heavenly. In fact, drinking the remaining milk is almost as pleasing as eating the Cinnamon Toast Crunch cereal itself. Mmm, buckle up. Let's see where we shall go next. Ah, the Danish. <laughs> Clearly from Brussels. A bear claw is a pastry that is somewhere between a Danish and a fritter. Once you look at a bear claw, you'll know exactly why it got that name because it, well, looks like a bear's foot. Ingredients vary, however popular fillings include almond paste, cream cheese, butter pecan, cherry, apples, and grape jelly. Eat one of these for breakfast and add some excitement to your day before you head out. You don't necessarily need to eat your breakfast, as you could also opt to drink it down. A fruit smoothie is a perfectly acceptable breakfast food that will give you enough calories, vitamins, and minerals to rev up your day. While strawberry is the most popular fruit used in a fruit smoothie, that's not where you should start if you're a fruit smoothie newbie. Instead, go with a mango smoothie. You don't need to add much, if any, sugar, and the result will be a wonderful breakfast concoction that you'll be thinking about for the rest of your day. Mexican food for breakfast is always a great idea. Chilaquiles is a dish that begins with corn tortillas that are fried very gently. Next, pulled chicken, refried beans, cheese, and eggs are added on top. To finish off this spectacular dish, salsa is poured over everything. And both red salsa or green salsa are perfectly acceptable. Guacamole can be added, but it's optional. 
Honestly, with so many flavors competing for your attention already, you don't really need it. Just grab a fork, put on a bib, and dig in. Yo Tiao is a breakfast food that is very popular in Asia. And while it sounds easy to make, it's a difficult breakfast food to master. If you've never tried it, you should first eat it at a restaurant. So what exactly is it? Yo Tiao is basically dough that is cut into logs and then deep fried. Easy, right? The key to frying these things is that they are best when piping hot, but start out too hot to eat. When done right, Yu Tiao is a breakfast food that you will remember for the rest of your days on Earth. Whether you call it monkey bread, pinch me cake, bubble loaf, or sticky bread, it all tastes absolutely delicious. This stuff is basically soft, pull-apart bread that has been blessed with a generous amount of butter, cinnamon, and sugar. A popular variation incorporates coffee flavor, especially if it's going to be eaten in the morning. And sometimes, chopped pecans are also added to this coveted breakfast food. While many people eat monkey bread for breakfast, it is also sold at carnivals and fairs, as the fact that it's a finger food makes it easy to eat while on the move. Irish soda bread is a type of bread you can make from scratch relatively fast, and it makes a delectable breakfast. It's a pretty simple bread that relies on buttermilk and baking soda for the rise instead of yeast, hence the name. With just flour, salt, baking soda, and some buttermilk, you'll have a delicious filling loaf of bread that's pretty much perfect when it's topped with marmalade or butter. You can optionally add raisins into the mix for a burst of flavor, or even something like olives or sun-dried tomatoes, although that's not quite as traditional. Either way, it's still yummy. A kolache is a fruit-filled pastry that is so addicting that there's no way you could just eat one for breakfast. And there's nothing wrong with that. Go ahead, grab another. The proper kolache has extremely light, puffy dough that is pleasant to bite into, making it the perfect pastry for seconds. It doesn't crumble in your fingers, and that fruit-filled center is just divine. If you're making kolaches at home, the easiest thing to do is just to use fruit pie filling. But really, the type of filling you go with is only limited by your imagination. Lemon, blueberry, apple, cherry, strawberry, and raspberry are all fantastic choices. Pancakes are just amazing. They're the breakfast food you forget about until the weekends, but when you serve them, they're always a win, right? Sure, you can mix everything from chocolate to pumpkin and from honey to bacon into your pancakes and, heck, even that cinnamon toast crunch we were talking about earlier but nothing tops blueberry pancakes. It's the perfect add-in, and there's no wrong way to make them. If you put fresh blueberries into your pancake mix, be sure not to stir too much because you don't want your blueberries to break up. If you use frozen blueberries, you don't need to let them defrost at all. Simply add the frozen blueberries to your pancake mix, and they'll be perfect by the time they're on your fork and headed to your taste buds. You love steak. Why not eat it for breakfast? All you need to do is fry up some eggs alongside your steak and you have a meal that you can eat for breakfast without any shame. While you can go with sirloin or strip steak, the best options are either ribeye or tenderloin. As far as the eggs are concerned, scrambled won't do. Pro tip, for a real steak and eggs breakfast, you need the eggs to be sunny side up. And if you want sauce for your steak, skip the steak sauce and reach for the Worcestershire sauce instead. Doesn't sound crazy after all, right? Eggs, bacon, sausages, hash browns, onions, six slices of white toast, double buttered on both sides with mustard, and a beer milkshake to wash it all down. If you've never heard of black and white pudding, you'll be surprised to learn that they're actually a type of sausage. A sausage that comes from the United Kingdom and Ireland, to be specific. The black pudding combines pork blood, pork fat, oatmeal, and spices. And yes, one of the ingredients really is pork blood, which means it can be something of an acquired taste. Not a fan? Try white pudding, which is a similar product, just with different spices and without the blood. Either one you choose, you can pick it up at a grocery store, and it tastes best if you fry it or grill it. They're often served with eggs or as part of a full fry-up, especially when eaten for breakfast. If the idea of an omelet for breakfast makes you yawn, you've obviously never had a Western omelet. They're so good that McDonald's once made a McMuffin out of one. And should those still be around? Yes. 
What makes a Western omelet? Well, a Western omelet is the addition of red bell peppers, green bell peppers, onions, and scallions. You'll also want to add diced boiled ham and a generous amount of cheese, whether it's cheddar, mozzarella, gouda, or Monterey Jack. Once the omelet is done cooking, you can add some black pepper on top to complete its transformation from boring to an exciting breakfast meal. A cinnamon roll for breakfast can get you ready for anything your day has to offer. Even if the sky is cloudy, you hate your job, and you wish you could just crawl back into bed, a cinnamon roll can lift your spirits. And best of all, you don't even need to do any of the heavy lifting. Instead, head to your local Cinnabon. Their cinnamon rolls are world famous for a reason. There's even a Cinnabon air freshener. Even if you're not sold on the idea of the massive super sweet treat for breakfast, one whiff will completely change your mind. Best of all, they make a great lunch too. So if your day is off to a really bad start, order two and you'll have at least one thing to look forward to that day. Eggs Benedict is a dish that was invented in the 1800s in New York City, and now it's a popular breakfast food from sea to shining sea. If you've never experienced the wonder that is Eggs Benedict, it's basically poached eggs on top of English muffin halves and ham or Canadian bacon that's all been drenched with hollandaise sauce. Sometimes you can find Eggs Benedict with smoked salmon, bacon, or avocado slices. However, if it's your first time, Start with the classic version and sprinkle a little bit of paprika on it. If you want to kick it up a notch and make it just a tad bit spicy, you can't go wrong. A crepe by itself is pretty underwhelming, as it's essentially a thin, fragile pancake. However, crepes can become delicious depending on how you dress them up. While the options are plentiful, the absolute best way to eat crepes is with Nutella and strawberries. While Nutella isn't as popular in America as it is in Europe, one taste of this creamy, chocolatey, hazelnutty spread will elevate this to a permanent spot in your kitchen cupboard. It's a must if you want to make the best crepes possible. And when you add strawberries on top, you'll have a breakfast that will start your day right. Why does pizza always seem to taste better the next morning? That's one of the universe's unanswered questions, but it's definitely true. If you ordered pizza last night but you weren't able to finish it off, just eat it the next morning. And here's the important part, don't reheat it. It might sound like the sort of pizza shenanigans that a high school student would pull, but here's the thing, it's amazing. And not only is it good, but it's so much better than improperly reheated pizza. You know, the rubbery stuff. You'll find that the flavors will be more intense, the cheese will be more satisfying, and the crust will have a more enjoyable texture. Pro tip, the more cheese and pepperoni, the better it'll be. It's so good, in fact, that you might find that when you're ordering a pizza to eat for dinner, you just might want to order another one just for breakfast. And maybe lunch, too. Chain restaurants have some of the most delectable desserts out there. Whose molten lava cake is top-notch? Who combined pizza and a cookie to perfection? Keep watching to find out which ones you must try. One of the most popular chain restaurants out there is definitely Chili's. There's a Chili's in just about every town in America, it seems. And the chain is known for having good food at solid prices. While not everything on the Chili's menu is known to be tasty, their appetizers like the Texas cheese fries are pretty popular. And entrees like the chicken crispers, fajitas, and burgers are all filling and satisfying. But what about their desserts? While most of Chili's desserts aren't anything very exciting, their molten chocolate cake is seriously impressive. As any molten cake, it features a warm chocolate cake exterior filled with a rich and decadent melted chocolate center. But at Chili's, the cake is also topped with a delicious scoop of ice-cold vanilla ice cream, topped with a chocolate shell topping, and then drizzled with even more chocolate. Basically, this dessert is any chocolate lover's dream and honestly tastes gourmet. If you've ever been to a Buffalo Wild Wings, then you know that the chain restaurant is pretty casual. It is a wing place, after all, and definitely has a sports bar vibe to it. 
Despite that, the food there is super tasty, and not just the wings. Yes, the wings and all the many flavors they come in are obviously amazing, but so are the other food items there, like the burgers, sandwiches, and wraps, as well as the appetizers. But one must-have item at Buffalo Wild Wings will probably surprise you. On the dessert menu, their loaded ice cream is seriously inventive. It might sound simple, but the flavor combination works so well and might even remind you of something you could eat at the county fair. The loaded ice cream features vanilla ice cream, topped with chocolate and caramel sauce, fried tortilla strips, and cinnamon sugar. Again, it might not sound like much, but it's seriously so good. Listen, Cracker Barrel knows how to make comfort food. It's kind of what they do best. The chain serves chicken and dumplings, meatloaf, fried chicken, fried fish, burgers, and more. But alongside all those savory options, Cracker Barrel also has some desserts, though not all are worth trying. However, if there's one dessert at Cracker Barrel you should give a shot, it's the cobbler. It's as close to homemade as you're going to find at any restaurant, and once you try it, you'll see why. The fresh fruit cobbler at Cracker Barrel is just about the most down-home, decadent, filling dessert out there. And even though Cracker Barrel is a chain restaurant, that shouldn't stop you from giving the peach cobbler a try. The fresh fruit, cooked with sugar and topped with a flaky crust, and then served with a scoop of vanilla ice cream, all seriously tastes so amazing. This is one dessert that you don't want to miss out on, that's for sure. Only at Olive Garden. We're all family here. Olive Garden is known for many things. There's the breadsticks that people have basically formed a cult around, the salad that you can top with parmesan and has an addicting dressing tossed throughout. Then there's the array of soups that will seriously satisfy you. And that's not even mentioning all the appetizer and pasta options, too. But what about the dessert at Olive Garden? Well, the chain definitely has a good amount of options, but are any of them worth it? Well, there's one that certainly is, which makes sense as it's a traditional Italian dessert. According to the Olive Garden website, the dessert is described as, quote, a layer of creamy custard set atop espresso-soaked ladyfingers. Obviously, if you're a coffee lover, this dessert will be perfect for you. But even if you aren't the biggest fan of coffee, the Olive Garden tiramisu is still something you might want to try out, as it's a very traditional dessert. BJ's Brewhouse obviously has a large menu, but the one thing they're most well-known for is actually a dessert. And not just any dessert. BJ's Brewhouse actually invented this dessert, or at least the clever name, so you shouldn't ignore it when you head there. The Pizuki, a pizza cookie, comes in many different flavors, all of which are sure to entice you. So next time you head to BJ's Brewhouse, don't fill up too much on the pizza, burgers, pastas, and appetizers, because you'll definitely want to save room for dessert. The pizuki is basically exactly what it sounds like. A fresh-baked, warm cookie served in a deep-dish pizza skillet and topped with ice cream, as well as some other toppings depending on the flavor of the cookie and what best complements it. The flavors of the pizukis are pretty interesting, too. There's classic chocolate chip, cookies and cream, strawberry shortcake, and seasonal flavors like a cinnamon apple for fall. So definitely try a BJ's pizuki at least once, although you'll probably want to revisit this dessert once you've tasted them. As delicious as P.F. Chang's is, you probably don't associate it with decadent desserts. P.F. Chang's is more well-known for its ramen and other Asian-inspired offerings like orange chicken, sushi, and so many more, all of which are seriously tasty. But their fire and ice dessert is on a whole other level. It's not the kind of dessert you would expect to find just anywhere, let alone at a chain restaurant. But the dessert is seriously worth trying out. It features moist and delicious bread pudding and cool vanilla ice cream covered in a chocolate shell coating. And then, to make it even better, the dessert is then covered in rum and set on fire when it's served. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. Bread pudding in and of itself is seriously delicious, but add ice cream, chocolate, and literal flames, and it becomes one of the best desserts you'll ever have. Red Lobster's Cheddar Bay Biscuits are moist, cheesy, flavorful, flaky, and just about perfect. 
And that's not even all, because all the shrimp, lobster, and fish on the menu are enough to keep you full for hours and hours. But next time you head to Red Lobster, try not to fill up too much on those free biscuits, because even though the rest of the Red Lobster menu is tempting, there's one dessert you definitely shouldn't skip. Yes, the key lime pie at Red Lobster is pretty spectacular, and though it's a simple dessert, it's also incredibly tasty. And after a heavy meal at the seafood chain, it's the perfect finishing touch. Like any key lime pie, the one at Red Lobster features a delicious, crumbly graham cracker crust, a creamy lime filling, and is topped with a sweet and tart raspberry glaze. Obviously, Outback Steakhouse is known for its steak, as well as a certain appetizer that people can't get enough of, the Bloomin' Onion. Outback Steakhouse also features a ton of delicious entrees and side dishes, as well as drinks that are sure to fill you up. However, that doesn't mean you shouldn't save room for dessert, because there's one sweet option at Outback that you should definitely try, even if you have to split it with a friend. Yes, it's that good. The salted caramel cookie skillet might sound relatively simple, almost like a pizookie from BJ's Brewhouse. But the dessert is a lot more complex than you imagine. The cookie isn't just a plain cookie. According to the Outback website, it's a warm, salted caramel cookie with pieces of white chocolate, almond toffee, and pretzels. All of that is served in a skillet and then topped with vanilla ice cream. In short, it's totally over the top and completely delicious. There's no denying the fact that Applebee's has some pretty tasty offerings. Some include appetizers like nachos, quesadillas, wings, and all the fried goods. There's also their entrees like burgers, chicken, pasta, and more. However, the dessert menu is often overlooked. And while several of the items on the restaurant's dessert menu don't seem all that exciting, there's one item that deserves your full attention. The Sizzlin' Caramel Apple Blondie is seriously intense. Cinnamon apples cooked in butter, underneath a butter pecan blondie, and then topped with vanilla ice cream and caramel sauce. Yeah, if that doesn't sound like a near-perfect dessert, then what does? Caramel and apple go together so well, but adding in a blondie with pecans in it just makes it ten times better. Now that's eating good in the neighborhood. There's no denying the fact that going to the Cheesecake Factory is an experience, and one that you can't escape without getting seriously full. Obviously, the Cheesecake Factory is known for its cheesecake, but typically when you eat at the chain restaurant, you also get to indulge in some super tasty food like fried macaroni and cheese, avocado egg rolls, pasta, fried chicken, burgers, and more. The menu is a literal book, so there's obviously a ton to choose from. And there are two pages of cheesecake, too. But there is one cheesecake that reigns supreme, and you should definitely try it out even if you aren't the world's biggest peanut butter fan. The peanut butter cup fudge ripple cheesecake is one that can't be ignored, and probably the best cheesecake on the menu, which is obviously saying something. According to the Cheesecake Factory's menu on the website, the dessert is, quote, a creamy cheesecake swirled with caramel, peanut butter, Butterfinger, and Reese's peanut butter cups. Yeah, definitely give this dessert a try. If you've ever eaten at a Maggiano's before, then you know the Italian chain restaurant is a little more upscale than your typical chain restaurant. While their entire menu is full of delicious offerings and both traditional and non-traditional Italian foods, there's one thing on the dessert menu you should try at least once. So don't fill up too much on pasta and bread, because this Maggiano's dessert will sweep you off your feet. Maggiano's warm apple crostata is your standard, traditional crostata, filled with sweet cinnamon apples wrapped in a flaky, buttery crust. It is then topped with vanilla bean ice cream and served over a delicious caramel sauce. As if that doesn't sound enticing enough, people really love this dessert, and reviews all agree that it's the best sweet treat on the menu at Maggiano's. So if you are ever at a Maggiano's, this take on an apple dumpling is where it's at. Here. The warm croissants served before your meal at Cheddar's definitely make the restaurant beloved, as do the large variety of menu options ranging from chicken fried steak to pasta, salad, and more. But their legendary monster cookie might just be the best thing on the menu, believe it or not. As the Cheddar's menu describes it online, the dessert is a scratch-made chocolate chip cookie, baked to order, with vanilla bean ice cream, homemade hot fudge, whipped cream, chopped nuts, and a cherry on top. 
As if a warm, freshly baked cookie wasn't good enough, the fact that it's topped with homemade fudge sauce makes it even better. Yes, a warm cookie topped with ice cream and fudge? It doesn't get much better than that. If there's one thing you can expect to get at Carrabba's, it's a delicious order of pasta, a super yummy bread or appetizer, some great steak or seafood, and maybe even a yummy cocktail. But Carrabba's also offers a pretty decadent dessert that any chocolate lover will seriously go crazy for. The Sonio di Chocolata, aka the chocolate dream at Carrabba's, might seem like a relatively simple dessert, but it's sure to impress you even if you aren't a huge chocolate fan. The Carrabba's website describes the dessert dessert as a, quote, rich fudge brownie with chocolate mousse, fresh whipped cream, and homemade chocolate sauce. Basically, it's a loaded brownie, but the real kicker is the chocolate mousse. Chocolate mousse is definitely one of the better chocolate desserts out there, so combining it with a brownie can only make it better. This dessert truly is a chocolate dream and something that you should try the next time you're at a Carrabba's or just when you get a serious chocolate craving. Like most chain restaurant steakhouses, Logan's Roadhouse has an expansive menu, and the focus definitely tends to be on the steaks and other entrees. Still, if you ever find yourself at a Logan's Roadhouse, then save room for dessert, because there's one item on their dessert menu that might shock you. It's so good and deceptively simple. Not only is the big old cheesecake a signature item at Logan's Roadhouse, but it's seriously delicious and pretty popular, too. The website describes it as, a towering slice of classic, velvety New York-style cheesecake on a graham cracker crumb crust served with fresh strawberries and whipped cream. The cheesecake at Logan's Roadhouse is a pretty great cheesecake. A simple yet decadent cheesecake is one of the best desserts out there, that's for sure. If you can eat it, you can fry it. From pastries to candy to international corn dogs, here are all the fried foods that need to end up on your plate as soon as possible. Falafel is a crispy fritter with many regional variants. It started its journey in Egypt or the Levant, but it's now internationally known and appreciated as a nutritious, convenient street snack and a great meat alternative. It consists of a thick legume paste traditionally made with chickpeas or broad beans. The paste is shaped into balls or elongated patties, which are then fried until crisp and golden. The seasonings inside falafels can vary, but they typically include garlic, onion, and herbs. When fried, these crisp, savory bites are usually tucked inside a thin flatbread and come served with tahini, hummus, and pickled or fresh veggies. Donuts are quite the versatile pastries. To speak of their origin would be a thankless task, considering that the first form of frying dough goes back to the ancient Greeks. According to Eater, the fried donut was already familiar in the United States by 1750, when the first recipe for a sweet fried dough was published in the Country Housewife's Family Companion. When it comes to American donuts, we're talking about a leavened dough that's fried and enjoyed as a dessert or a sweet snack. It's usually sugar-coated or glazed and can also be filled with custards or fruit jams. Whatever variety is your favorite, you certainly can't live without munching down on the this crispy sweet pastry. And I can't live without it! Samosas are stuffed fried pastries that are one of the best representatives of a classic that will never go out of style. They're best known in India, as the country abounds in various samosa styles that range in shape, size, and ingredients. They usually come in triangle or moon shapes, while the typical fillings include paneer, potatoes, or meat. But the combinations are virtually endless, and they tend to be regionally influenced. These crisp packets of goodness are absolutely beloved, and they're usually enjoyed as an appetizer in Indian restaurants. But surprisingly enough, it seems that they didn't actually originate in India. Instead, they developed from sambusak, which first appeared in the Middle East sometime in the 10th century. It then spread through the region, eventually reaching India, where it would evolve into one of the country's quintessential dishes. At its most basic, a chimichanga is a deep-fried burrito that combines a flour tortilla and various fillings like ground beef, beans, cheese, and rice. Regardless of the filling, the main prerequisite for any chimichanga is to fry it in copious amounts of oil to attain that perfectly crispy crust. It's best served with salsas, guacamole, and sauces. The history of the chimichanga is quite murky. As reported by the Los Angeles Times, several Arizona-based restaurants take credit for creating this beefy fried dish. Though it's common in Mexican restaurants in the U.S., you'll rarely find it in Mexico, which corroborates the story of its American origin. Honey, I'm in the mood for chimichanga! So make a chimichanga! 
Essentially, Pizza Frida is a fried pizza that, unsurprisingly, comes from Naples, Italy, the hometown of pizza. This dish is made with dough that usually holds a flavorful tomato and cheese filling. The sealed packet is fried until the crust is crisp and golden, and the filling turns into a creamy, stretchy cheese delight. Fried pizza was born out of necessity during World War II, when pizza ovens were scarce and food shortages were common. Frying pizza dough proved to be a convenient and affordable alternative, and from this technique, one of the most emblematic Neapolitan dishes was thus born. Scotch egg consists of a boiled egg covered in sausage meat and coated in breadcrumbs, neatly packed and fried until crisp and golden. In Scotland, they're a national treasure and are available virtually everywhere, from supermarkets to gas stations and restaurants. But despite its name, it might not actually originate from the land of highlands, kilts, and bagpipes. As it turns out, scotch eggs actually have a more complex origin. They might have been modeled on Nargisi kofta, a similar meat-coated egg dish of Indian origin possibly introduced by English soldiers who returned from placements in India. Another theory involves Fortnum & Mason, a department store that also serves food, which claims that it was the first to think of scotch eggs as a convenient and portable snack for wealthy travelers. Regardless of these theories, claims, and legends, this fried egg specialty is a must-try in British pubs. It tastes delicious, whether warm or cold. Regardless of how you feel about frying candy bars in general, the Deep Fried Mars deserves to be on your must-eat-before-you-die list. This unusual concoction starts off with a regular Mars bar, which is made with chocolate, nougat, and caramel. It's then coated in batter and deep-fried until golden and crispy. The Deep Fried Mars bar originates in Stonehaven, Scotland, where it was first made in 1995 at a local fish and chip shop. It actually originally resulted from a dare, and it eventually became so popular that it is nowadays called the unofficial dish of Scotland. Despite some bad press, this legendary candy has managed to endure over the years, and travel books often list it as an essential Scottish dish. Deep fried cheese appears in several national cuisines, as many foodies have realized that this already perfect ingredient can be upgraded by deep frying it. The technique is rather straightforward. Cheese is usually battered and then fried in sizzling oil, creating a crispy layer that coats the partially melted cheese. Mozzarella sticks are one of the best-known examples and a favorite in the U.S., but that's not the only way to deep fry cheese. The Venezuelan version, known as tequeños, is made with cheese sticks wrapped in pastry and then fried. Europeans have similar adaptations as well. The one that stands out is the Czech edition, in which the whole slice is breaded and fried. And unlike its counterparts, it typically makes for a meal of its own. Whichever version is your favorite, you should always eat it freshly prepared. Croquetas are small Spanish fritters that come in a myriad of flavors. They usually consist of a creamy base made with thickened bechamel that serves as an excellent playing ground for numerous flavor combinations. However, the classic ham croquette is the most popular version. Spanish croquettes are traditionally served and enjoyed as tapas, the beloved Spanish tradition of serving small bites with drinks. Unlike the French counterpart made with mashed potatoes, the Spanish version is distinguished for its use of bechamel, resulting in a deep-fried specialty with an incredibly creamy center, held together by the crispy fried crust. Struffoli is the Neapolitan version of crispy fried dough tidbits that are typically enjoyed for Christmas. This dish probably has Greek origins, and similar varieties exist throughout Italy. What sets these fritters apart is the way they're served. When they attain the right crispiness, tiny struffoli are doused in honey and then covered in candy, candied fruit, and colorful sprinkles, resulting in quite the eye-catching treat. Struffoli is typically associated with Christmas, but in the Italian-American tradition, it's also a part of Easter celebrations. Cochinhas are a Brazilian fritter made with a creamy mix of shredded chicken and local cream cheese, known as a queijo, that's neatly wrapped with dough. It's a clever name, as cochina translates in English to little thigh. That's a reference to the distinctive shape that roughly resembles a chicken drumstick. After the large croquettes are breaded and fried, the pieces attain a golden crispy crust, while the filling becomes a warm, partially melted delight. Cochinhas most likely originated in Sao Paulo, sometime in the 1800s, and they later spread to other parts of Brazil and are now enjoyed throughout the country. The locals mostly enjoy them as a street food or snack, and they typically come served with different sauces and dips. Frito Misto is an excellent example of how Italians abide by the idea that everything is better when fried. The phrase Frito Misto literally translates to fried mix, and the dish is precisely that, a mixture of fried ingredients that can include meat, seafood, veggies, and even cream or cookies. On the seaside, the favored version is a seafood mix that comes filled with crunchy bits of fried calamari, anchovies, or shrimp, whereas the northern style is often filled with vegetables and some slightly unusual additions such as offal and semolina. In the Marque region, the obligatory addition includes stuffed and fried olive ascalane. These fried mixes make a great snack or an appetizer. Though there are no rules when it comes to ingredients, it always needs to be made fresh. You're probably already familiar with American corn dogs, but the Korean version is an entirely different ballgame. 
The latter reportedly first appeared in the 1980s. In the beginning, they were a simple, unpretentious snack in the form of sausages coated in corn batter and then deep fried. But corn dogs then grew into a national craze, which led to the emergence of numerous varieties. The most popular version these days is the one that incorporates chopped french fries in the corn batter. The combinations are endless and may include standard condiments or some traditional options made with kimchi or rice cakes. Some corn dog shops also offer customized options, allowing you to dress them up to your liking. Couple more nitrate sickles, please. Two corn dogs coming up. Youtiao is a humble Asian snack that can best be described as the Chinese cruller. It's known by various names, and the early version had quite a distinctive, elongated form that reportedly resembled a human shape, whereas the modern version looks a bit different. Youtiao is mostly enjoyed at breakfast, and though it makes a great snack on its own, it also pairs well with congee or any other soups or stews. In addition to China, these popular fritters are found in other Asian countries as well. You'll most likely find it at street stalls. If you're in the right area, don't miss the chance to munch down on a freshly prepared Yotiao with its crisp crust and soft, tender center. Chile's rellenos is a fusion dish and New Mexican staple that has its origins in the Mexican city of Puebla. It consists of a large stuffed pepper coated in batter and fried. It's usually made with green peppers that are roasted and skinned before they're filled and fried. The most common version is made with poblano peppers and stuffed with cheese, usually served doused in red tomato sauce. Variations abound, and many include other peppers, which must be large enough to hold the stuffing. Other styles can also include beef or pork fillings, nuts, raisins, and different sauces. Pakora is an Indian staple consisting of various deep-fried ingredients such as green peas or prawns. It's a humble dish enjoyed throughout the country, though it appears in several slightly different varieties and under numerous names. Experts believe that 16th-century Portuguese traders stopped in India on their way to Japan, bringing Indian cooks with them who made pakora. These cooks must have brought the food to Japan, and the dish became what we know as tempura. Pakora can be enjoyed as a snack, a side dish, at tea time, or as a meal all on its own. Though it's traditionally vegetarian, any vegetable meat, or seafood can be made into a pakora. Most Indian regions have a signature version that can differ in the base ingredients, their seasonings, or the components that are added to the batter. Bitter bala are small round fritters consisting of meat fillings that have Dutch origins. They typically come served with a mustard dip and make a great pairing with any alcoholic drink. They're best enjoyed freshly prepared, while the center is still warm and gooey. Bitter bala have a long history in their native Netherlands. They were reportedly made in the 1700s at a local Amsterdam pub, owned by a man named Jan Behrens. His wife created these small ragu-filled bites that they later served to their guests. And now, after all those years since, these crispy balls remain a favorite Dutch snack. Well, I hope you enjoyed your introduction to Bitter bala. Arancini are deep-fried rice balls filled with savory fillings that are fried until the pieces attain a golden, crispy crust. These large fritters hail from Sicily, where they originated in the 10th century. They were named after the orange, which is arancia in Italian. This was most likely because of the orange color they attained during frying, which resembles that of the fruit. Arancini typically hold a savory, meat-based filling, and along with typical round shapes, the one from eastern Sicily may also have a cone-like form. Most people associate fried green tomatoes with the traditional cuisine of the American South. This dish consists of thick slices of lightly battered green tomatoes fried in sizzling oil. Though it sounds modest and not even remotely spectacular, the appeal of this dish is in its simplicity. Fried green tomatoes were popularized in 1991 by the movie of the same name, based on Fanny Flagg's novel that told the story of friendship, support, and Southern hospitality, all paired with some delicious regional dishes. Since then, most people have believed that fried green tomatoes originated in the South. However, according to Robert F. Moss, author of The Fried Green Tomato Swindle and other Southern culinary adventures, this concoction was actually first brought to the Northeast and Midwest, most likely by Jewish immigrants, and only later spread to the South. Whatever their origin, these fried veggies are an excellent starter that you can eat anytime, anywhere. Fried artichokes are a traditional Roman appetizer. Originally, they were called carciofi alla Judea, which can be roughly translated as artichokes Jewish style. This dish has a long history in the Italian capital, probably originating centuries ago among the Jewish community, hence the name. The artichokes are fried whole, and as they fry, the leaves open and crisp up, creating a delectable flour with hidden pockets of salt and artichoke juices. Traditionally, old-school restaurants would fry these veggies twice for added crispiness. We imagine you'll want to eat them twice for added deliciousness. A cronut is a delicious cross between a croissant and a donut. If you've never tried it before, it may sound strange, but once you taste it, you'll never forget it. The cronut was invented by legendary New York City baker Dominique Ansel, who worked on the recipe for three months before it was finally ready to sell. 
When the cronut was introduced, Ansel's shop became the trendiest spot in the city, with people lining up in front to get a taste of this newfangled pastry. That popularity is easy to understand, as the cronut is a flaky and crispy pastry with many layers filled with cream, coated in sugar, and covered in a glaze. Simply put, it's a definite must-fry and must-try. They may run out of cronuts. <laughs> Beignets are of European origin, but this delicious square of fried dough is now inextricably related to New Orleans, where it found its spiritual home. It's made with leavened dough that puffs up into a flaky, golden delight when it's dropped into sizzling oil. There are really no rules about when you can enjoy your beignet. It's ideal as a breakfast, a snack, brunch, late dinner, or all of the above. Just make sure you have your napkin ready, as the generous amount of sugar on top will inevitably end up everywhere. Ideally, you should pair a beignet with café au lait to get the full taste of this top-notch New Orleans tradition. Langos is a Hungarian specialty. It's a round disc of fried dough that can be topped with various savory ingredients. Made with leavened dough, Langos is thinly stretched and dropped into a copious amount of sizzling oil to puff, crisp up, and attain that delightful caramel color. You can eat it as is, but adding a spread of garlic or sour cream with cheese will surely elevate it to the next level. Langos is traditionally enjoyed as a street snack, and Langos stalls also commonly appear during any celebration, gathering, or festivity. You better be hungry when you come to Hungary. I'm hungry. Ice cream is excellent all on its own, but have you ever had it fried? If you've yet to have the pleasure, now's the perfect time. First, freeze a baking sheet for a few hours. Then scoop balls of ice cream onto parchment paper on the baking sheet. After 30 minutes of freezing, the scoops must be thoroughly coated in batter and then dipped into the fryer. The batter will crisp up and create a protective layer that will keep the ice cream nice and cold. Though it sounds like a magic trick, we encourage you to try it to discover that there's no big secret to it, just big flavors and interesting textures. The origin of fried ice cream is rather murky, but the most popular varieties include Asian tempura battered ice cream and a Mexican-style version with cereal and cookie crumb coating. The Japanese have perfected the art of frying, and that includes taking great pride in a certain fried specialty known as kushiage. The name encompasses a variety of small-sized snacks that are skewered and then fried in sizzling oil. Though it sounds similar to tempura, the batter for kushiage includes an egg and some breadcrumbs, creating a firmer crust than the one delivered by tempura. The skewers are served with a dipping sauce on the side and some pickled cabbage strips that should cleanse your palate before each bite. Kushiage is typically made with beef or pork morsels, lotus root, or fish. A dessert mentioned in the ancient book 1001 Nights just had to make the list of deep-fried dishes you have to try before you die. In its simplest form, lokma is a deep-fried dessert made with leavened dough shaped into small, round balls. When the bites come out of the fryer, they're doused in honey and then ready to be eaten. This treat is common in many Mediterranean and Middle Eastern countries, where it is typically prepared for festivities and gatherings. Traditionally, lokma balls are covered in honey or date syrup, but they can also be sweetly delicious with a drizzle of chocolate or caramel. If something's fried, I'm gonna eat it.